What is going on, everybody? Lance's creepy reading here, and welcome to the very first episode of Midnight Madness of the Midnight Madness podcast. And I am live right now with my good friend Kay Banning Kellum. Hey, what's going on, Lance? How's everything? Everything is going absolutely fine. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me, as always. You're welcome. It's a bit late, but I figured that midnight is always the best time to have a scary, spooky podcast. Uh, it really is, man. I mean, I can remember going and seeing Faces of Death 4 at a midnight uh, theater showing of it. And uh, yeah, just something about, I don't know, just something about doing stuff late at night, midnight, especially, especially when it's like horror related, man. I don't know. That's just like the, the, the magic sauce for it there, I think. Oh, yeah, of course. And we got some people in the chat right now. Uh, Mandy Mortem. Hello. How are you? And yes, you were the first person in the chat. And we have the Maniacs. Hello, Maniacs. Ahoy there, Lance. The power of sus has blessed this stream. Okay, then. Uh, thank you for being here. I hope everybody in the chat is having a great night so far. <clears throat> and you guys can't tell by the title, we will be talking about uh, the Mega Collab I made for Jeff the Killer 2015 that was just recently, recently released. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the video itself, talk about the story, and I'll ask Kay some questions about how he came up with the idea for the story and what made him want to um, write a remake on the, Jeff Killer, on the Jeff the Killer story in the first place. So with that, with plenty of questions, and you guys can ask your own questions in the chat, uh, we will definitely answer them if we get any. And with that being said, let's start this stream off, right? And all right, so Kay... So Lance, what is going on, man? What you been up to? Oh man, um, sh well you know I got the book out. Um, you know, uh, Grigri and Juju, all right, a, uh, and it has kind of been, you know, I, I published that in January, and that has kind of been my my biggest thing. Like that's been my, you know, that that's been where all my focus has been really on trying to, you know, get. Uh, book signing days and kind of like, you know, get the, uh, get interviews, you know, on different horror websites, kind of get the word out there about it. Um, that's been, you know, that is a, uh, it's an anthology of, of 12 of my favorite stories that I've ever written. And, uh, you know, so that, that's been, that's been me. That's been a lot of me lately. It's been that. Yeah. And as you know, I actually got a copy of that book right now. Awesome. I like that. Yeah, for those who don't know, the story is called, or the book is called Gris, Gris, and Juju. You can find it on Amazon for like maybe $10 right now. Is that right? No, Gris, Gris. This is a lot of people call it Gris, Gris. Oh, <laughs> my mistake. <laughs> no, it's quite all right. Trust me. That It's kind of, I, I put a lot of very like New Orleans-y specific, um, you know, kind of uh, terminology into the title. I mean, that was by design, of course. But yes, I can also completely understand that it is, not the easiest thing to say if you're not used to these words. It is Grigri and Juju, a New Orleans horror lanyap. And that is available on Amazon, uh, paperback and Kindle. So pick your poison. And of course, I did also uh, link the uh, link your book in the description of the video to make sure people will know about it. There you go. Even better. Hey, y'all just check the link and um, and there there it is. Um, oh, it's hello, Sean. How are you? Oh, sorry you know, to interrupt you. <laughs> quite all right. um, I, I'm just a big fan of anthologies, you know, and I had all these stories, <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of there. And it's like, well, none of them are long enough to be a book by themselves. And what I love about anthologies is just that, you know, if you, you know, you've got such an, you know, you got such an option there and it kind of appeals to the, you know, kind of the appetites of, you know, today where, you know, you want to jump from one thing to the next. If you don't like it, you move on to the next thing. So you got 12 options. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, you're going to love them all. You can pick your favorites. Most definitely, man. Most definitely. Um, what was I going to say? Well, now that the uh, promotion stuff is out of the way, uh, let me ask you some questions about the video. Is that all right? Absolutely. Go for it. All right. So let's get this one out of the way. What did you think about the video as a whole? I loved it. You guys, I mean, you guys did a fantastic job with it. I mean, everything was... Uh, it, it was it was is it, it was very entertaining to listen to for something that you know that I wrote. It's like I know how this ends, obviously, but still, it was great. And I mean, just the the different uh, the mega collab in and of itself, having so many different different talents involved in it, 
you know, you really got to kind of wait in anticipation to say, oh, I wonder how this person's going to portray this character. I mean, it was just, it was just a really great, really great video. I highly suggest everybody check it out. You'll be glad you did. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I put a lot of work into that video. I'm not trying to sound desperate for views or whatever, but I, I really do think that video is well worth your time. A lot of, a lot of heart went into that video, and I really think it's one of my best. Um, <clears throat> was there, were there any uh, voice actors that stuck out to you in a way? Like anyone that's your favorite? Uh, I, I'm, yeah. I mean, that's like asking you know somebody to to. Pick a favorite uh, pizza topping, man. I don't know. They all work together so well. Uh, I, I I couldn't pick a favorite. I'm going to tell you that I enjoyed everybody's work that they did on it. I mean, it, it, it just blended together perfectly. So, I mean, I guess I guess anybody <laughs> into it out there, you can kind of pick your favorite uh, person. But I'm going to tell you, like, everybody did great. Uh, I couldn't possibly in a million years pick one over the other. Everybody was fantastic. <laughs> Well, that's good to hear, man. It's good to hear. I was kind of hoping that my Jeff voice wasn't too forced. Like, I know most people, whenever they talk in the Jeff voice, they always have like the whole like deep gritty voice, like they're trying to do, trying to do like a bad Batman impression. But uh, what I did was a little cliche. Yeah, I did the, did the whole deep deep voice thing, but honestly, I just can't help myself because that's how everyone portrays Jeff the Killer when he goes insane. And I think you actually told me on Skype a while ago that um. That's not how you envision Jeff. Jeff would talk at all, even when he's insane. Like he still sounds the same as he always did before when he was normal. Yeah, I mean, I guess kind of my internal monologue for the character uh, when he would talk was just always, you know, I mean, clearly, yeah, I mean, the, the tones would get darker once he, you know, snapped. But you know, trying to stay within those realms of realism, as I've said before, you know, to people like that, that was one of my big goals in writing the reboot was to bring more realism to the story. You know, I don't know if that, you know, if, you know, if somebody's voice would dramatically change to just happen to be, okay, now I'm scarier. So now I sound scarier. I don't know. That might be a little contrived. So, yeah, I mean, I think his voice would definitely be affected, you know, when he changed his personality and all that kind of stuff. But I don't see it as necessarily he would drop it down several, you know, uh, several degrees like that now but you know I think like look I and mean, I you got like everybody can kind of put their own spin on it so I mean I don't think there's any right or wrong Jeff voice it's kind of whatever you know whatever gets you into the character when you're recording it <laughs> if anything they could probably like give Jeff like the Joker voice <laughs> I don't know I think the, I think the Batman voice would be easier to listen to over an extended narration <laughs> I'm Jeff the Killer. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that's very Batman. -y. Yeah. Um, actually, scratch the whole Batman thing. Actually, whenever I listen to it like nowadays, I think to myself like, "Huh, maybe I'm not trying to go for like a whole Batman vibe. Maybe I'm trying to I'm trying to do like a poor man's imitation of Solid Snake from Metal Gear." Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't know, man. I I, I think by now, like the Batman voice has become such a kind of running joke. I don't know itself that like I don't think there is a true Batman voice anymore. I just think there's a whole lot of like parodies of the Batman. Uh, I mean that is mostly true, yeah. Batman's kind of like a beaten down topic in in most things nowadays. But we're not here talking about Batman. We're talking about Jeff the Killer. That's right, and most importantly, the the incredible video that you guys put out. I mean that's. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very honored. I'm put it to you that way. Like that's that's kind of the word that comes to mind. Like the fact that so many people would come together to put effort into essentially a, a passion project. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, um, and that's just it's like, you know, all I can say is wow, that that's really cool. You know, to think that that something that you write is is worth that much effort to people. Yeah, and a quick shout out to the cast. Um, you guys did a fantastic job in the video. Like a lot of you guys actually did really yeah you did really well and the voice performance like it's exactly or almost exactly how i envisioned everything would be would be said essentially like shout out to lady white rabbit who played sheila woods in the in the video she did a fantastic job she she has a good voice a good cadence that that really brings the personality of sheila woods to life as well as uh darkness tales who played matt woods like 
his voice sounds very, very fatherly, fatherly to me. Like, I don't know why he just does. So I thought that the way he delivered his lines as well was a really, was really good and really believable. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, nobody's lines struck me as, you know, as like reading from, uh, you know, just like reading off a piece of paper or anything like that. Like it definitely felt like a performance that didn't feel like, you know, you were just reading the dialogue of the characters. Absolutely. It was very easy to get engaged in the story. Yeah. I was a little worried about that because there have been times where I've heard collaborations where, a lot of people that are featured it sound like sound like they're reading from the script and not really putting any emotion or inflection into their performances. Like they're not trying to make it look believable. With here, uh, everybody did that just fine, and I really enjoyed it. Everybody did a fantastic job. Agree, hundred percent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I did notice actually throughout the video. Um, there were times where my fade effect didn't work. Like every time I have a new transition, like I switch. I like fade into a new image each and every time. Yet for some reason, it would just immediately cut to the next image I was going to use, even though I could swear while I was editing the whole thing, I actually, I actually did put in the uh, fade effect on said image after I put in the effects. But I guess maybe it canceled out when I when I applied it. I, I honestly don't know what happened. But yeah, it's stuff like that that just kind of makes the video look kind of choppy to me in a way. Like I always like it whenever it transitions to something else. Like it's. Hey, this scene changed, and now it's going into something like this, for example, like a flare gun in a garage or whatever. Let's cut to let's cut to like a fade in of someone holding the flare gun, and I use that image that used to be on the wiki before you changed it. And uh, <clears throat> of course, I changed the background to it as well, which I thought was a pretty nice touch. But it just cut straight to the flare gun picture, and I just can't believe I missed that during the whole editing process. I thought maybe I should have. I uh, double checked it to make sure that um, the proper effect was used, but this is just a little nitpick of mine that I have. I I know most people don't really care about that in the video, but it's just it's something that just really bugs me. Well, you know, it's I think it's the same thing with you know ebook styled you know narrative storytelling as it is with you know reading as it is with anything else. Is it's all about you know you know immersion of whether it's the reader the viewer the listener whatever you got there immersion is the most important thing and just about anything can break immersion which is why you know attention to detail is such a big thing you know people might say why does that matter you know uh, if it's something so small in the grand scheme of things but if it takes the person out of the story for even a second they go oh look at that you know that that wasn't a very convincing fade or you know that's that's all it takes to like kind of break that immersion and you know, you have a very short window of time to kind of get that person back in there again to the story. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely, it is important that you know, your visual aesthetics are are extremely important, especially in this, because, you know, you, you want to create like that comfortable kind of space for the person to watch what they're listening to, if that makes sense. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, so I, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's good that you and that just goes back into what I was saying earlier, like why it's so well, I think it's so cool that you guys put so much effort, especially, you know, with, with you just talking about these like little attention to detail things, you know, because to take on a project like this and to concern yourself with stuff like that shows that, you know, you really do truly care about what you're putting out there. And that's, that, that's the hallmark of an artist. So, you know, awesome. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I will admit that took me a while, a while just to finish because it took me like four months just to get that whole thing made. And I will say this, guys, it really shouldn't have taken me so long just to get that video up. It really shouldn't have. I just I wish I could have got that done so much sooner. It felt like it was just like way too late uh, into the year when I uploaded it because I kept promising that it would be uploaded in like January and that didn't happen. Just life kept getting in the way of everything. It just uh, it really bummed me out. I really well, wish. That's why I, always, that's why I always tell people, you know, being, you know, be careful with, you know, giving yourself deadlines and especially like announcing those. Um, you really got to, you know, you don't really want to start announcing, you know, timelines and, and things like that until you can, you're, you're I mean, just look at, look at tonight with, with our podcast, how closely it came to where we may have had to announce delays or, you know, something like that. So anything can go wrong and screw it up. So, yeah, I mean, the fact that you stuck to it, though, is awesome. 
Oh yeah, most definitely, man. I'm glad we can get we can get this podcast out of the way too. I did. I did always intended. I was intended to like have a stream after the video was up, just like as like a little follow up where the author gives their thoughts on the whole thing, and see if they liked it or not, what they didn't like, this, that, and the other. Just you know, critique it in a way. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, those of you in the chat, I want to see real fast. If you saw the Jeff the Killer video, uh, tell me what did you think about it, and uh, what did you think about the story as a whole. Uh, leave your comment down below and let us know. I think the maniacs had already kind of got, he said, not going to lie, Jeff was better than the original one. Also, just damn. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, the maniacs. <laughs> thank you, maniacs. So nice of you to say. Let's see. Still Where don't know you? what the power of sus is, but I'm glad it, it seems like <laughs> a good power. It seems like oh, a power yeah. of good. <laughs> Sounds like some kind of like YouTube poop meme. Man, these days I don't know what half the stuff on the internet means. I feel like just a lot of memes and shit, man. I don't know what that is. Got to Google that shit. Yeah. Uh, if there's one meme I'll always love. It's whenever uh, the whole "We Are Number One" meme plays. It's about that uh, Robbie Rotten guy, like Stefan Carl, poor guy who died uh, recently. But back in 2016, uh, his song "We Are Number One" just became like a big meme. And the videos were just so psychedelic and creative. It was just amazing. Like, that's something I'll never get tired of. And the, uh, <clears throat> when, uh, Smash Mouth's song All Star became a meme, like, that was pretty funny, too. Like, I loved that song as a kid, and just seeing it resurrected into a meme was always so funny. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess, it, God, yeah, I haven't thought about that song in forever, but I tell you, that is the one song that will play on any like you you go to any store where they have like the corporate piped in like music and they're like all right we gotta put on a fun song here folks and it is for forever is forever always that song somebody uh, once told me the world is gonna roll me <laughs> i ain't singing this time lance <laughs> why not man makes, you get you yeah, gotta was, let your voice out man let it shine yeah it doesn't really shine so much as it uh <laughs> <laughs> Look, if I thought I could, if I thought I had a shot at, at being appreciated for singing, I would, I would try it. Um, but believe me, this guy is never going to be known for his, uh, for his singing voice, and that, I'm okay with that. <laughs> if if you say that you can't sing, you're lying to yourself. Anybody can sing. It just depends on how you use your voice and what your range is. Okay, I know that I can physically put melody to spoken word yes um but whether that is something that anybody would ever want to hear that's the uh i think i'll just i'll keep it between me and my shower curtain and everybody will be great. Oh, the shower curtain. <laughs> you know man you, you do you i don't know what the hell you sing in the shower but hopefully it's something harmonic um it is you know my shower has never complained even though sometimes the water comes out really <laughs> hot for no reason that might be that might be the shower's way of telling me to shut up. I don't know. No, no, man. The shower must really like it. It must really, really like it. That's why I get in, it's getting so hot in there. Yeah, there you go. There's there's a positive spin. It's it just I'm, I'm literally turning up the heat. It's getting steamy in here. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's so steamy whenever you see Kay sings in the shower. The shower just can't get enough of it. That's why it sprinkles down even faster whenever it hears him carry a tune. My God, look, for anybody out there who tuned into this thinking we was going to be talking about horror and then, and then found a conversation talking about me in the shower, I apologize. No, no, we're so here talking about, we're talking about the sexy shower incident, you know? And so I know that that is true horror, though. I'm not going to lie. Like, that, that is a true <laughs> element of horror right there. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's K. Ban and Kellum talking about himself in the shower. That is, that is a universal horror. I, I'm pretty sure that would scare just about anybody. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I, I agree. Actually, come to think of it, I was—I remember uh, hearing a story by Vincent Vicava a while ago. Um, it was called Right on Time. I don't know if you ever heard of that one. It's like it's another Jeff the Killer story where there's some guy who sneaks into a woman's house to kill her, and she's in the shower or whatever. He goes to kill her. She's already dead. And the guy finds out that Jeff the Killer was the one who beat him to the punch, and then he kills him at the end of the story. There's more context, but I thought it was a really nice, nice little Jeff story. Well, plus that's just kind of a really cool like approach to take it from. It's like, oh, it's from the killer's perspective, and okay, so you're waiting for this guy to, you know, and then he turns out to be the victim at the end as well as his intended victim. Yeah, that's that's uh, 
That's a really cool approach, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> when, when brainstorming when I was going to write, you know, my entry for the for the 2015, you know, run that one. I was trying to think of like what is the, you know, what what's the best way to kind of reapproach the story. Uh, but of course, it had to be like you know, kind of a reboot following the original formula. So I couldn't get, I couldn't get like too over the top, like going my own direction. <laughs> But, I mean, that's what you got, like, I guess, Scars for Corruption and all other stuff for. That's where I kind of put my own little spin more and more on it. Uh, oh, yeah. And you should, with each installment, you're always throwing in, like, little pot shots at the original. St- well, I shouldn't say original because the 2011 version is not the original story at all whatsoever, but it's the most well-known. Well, no, I throw, pot shot, I throw pot shots at my story. Oh, yeah, that that's, is true. <laughs> well, but just, well, 2015. Yeah, I remember that, actually. Um the story might get a lot of hate, but I will admit, I I don't think it's entirely justifiable. I mean, people are allowed to have their own opinions. They can hate the story if they want. They can like it. Really, it doesn't really matter. But uh, <clears throat> if there's one thing that you can't deny, and most people can't deny, that it definitely is better than the original story, well, the 2011 story, and a little bit more realistic, at least. Well, realism was was kind of like the big goal that I kind of had with it. Like, you know, when I, when I was trying to look at ways to, you know, redo it, it's like, what are the biggest complaints that people always have about it? And it's like, well, you know, the, the bleach and the vodka and the skateboard over the fences and that kind of stuff. So, you know, that, that was, those were kind of what birthed a lot of the newer, I guess, you know, kind of like elements that I added to it, like the flare gun as opposed to the bleach and, and stuff like that. You know, that was kind of the motivation behind those things. It was like, all right, let me, what would really be something that could happen in like a suburban neighborhood, you know, yeah. that was a little bit more, you know, because once again, we talk about reader engagement. We talk about, you know, when you type in, you know, when you write up something that, that's that out of the ordinary, even in a fiction story, you still have to follow like whenever the lo- whatever logic the universe you're writing in would deem, you know, so... Yes, like Star Trek can get away with all kind of crazy crap, but they're also keeping it well within, like, <coughs> you know, the universe's logic. So, so you know, yeah, so that's what I was trying to do. I was like, I don't want to break reader immersion with, with something where people stop and go, wait, somebody did that? No. So that's a lot of that, I guess, you know, turned more into, like, realistic, I don't know, what could really happen as opposed to, you know, the original so you know that's kind of my method on that yeah I, I see what you mean though um quick side note by the way you guys are hearing me coughing quite a lot it's because i uh, just i picked up a cough somehow i don't know why i just did so i'm a little sick at the moment so um <clears throat> don't be too annoyed if you hear me clear my throat every once in a while it's just something i can't control it really annoys me i'm sorry but uh, i'm a little mad about that because um because right as soon as i upload this new video so i've been working on for like months on end want to get back into the swing of things of uploading more content i get sick like what perfect timing am i gonna have to put more videos on hold because i can't record properly unless i get my voice back like i know i don't really sound all that different now but that might change in the next few days or so if this gets worse and plus i hate having to constantly clear my throat whenever i have to record a story like that just really annoys me but it's just something I can't control. But well, if we all get I mean, sick, man. No shit. Can't help it. If we could control it, nobody would ever get sick. I can't think anybody would ever be like, all right, well, you know, it's about that time of the month, time to get a flu. No, I, I'm pretty sure we'd all be healthy year round if we had any control over it. If any of you guys have been sick this this spring, like I am so sorry. Hope you guys are feeling a lot better, though. Dude, a few years ago, me and my wife went to Salt Lake City. And uh, woke up the morning of the flight, felt good, felt great. I was all excited. I'm like, oh, I'm going to see mountains. I've seen mountains before, you know. We fly up to Utah, and as the plane is landing, I can already tell. I'm like, shit, I am getting fucking sick. You know, I always know. I know it's coming. And by that evening, I felt like, I, I felt like crap. I'm like, God damn it, I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> Spent the whole vacation feeling like crap. Um, and, yeah, that's no way to vacation. Ugh, no way at all. I wish I could take a vacation, but I can't do that. But if I were going to take a vacation, 
I wouldn't want to do it in the country I live in right now. Not to say that I hate it here. No, no, absolutely not. This isn't me saying that I hate where I live. I want to travel outside the country and see what it's like. Like I mentioned before yeah, that I, I, I mentioned I before that I desperately want to go to Italy like really badly because that's part of my heritage. I'm part Italian and yeah. it would be amazing to actually go there. It's been a dream of mine, but odds of that happening now or maybe in the future, I'm not too sure about that. I just wish it could actually happen. I mean, it's, you know, look, a lot of people go to Europe. All right. I did. It's not that, you know, trust me. I always tell people, especially in writing advice, they just say, look, I can fucking do it. Can do it. But that the, the Kellum rule kind of applies across the board in all things. So if, <laughs> the if Kellum I could rule. manage to take, yeah, and it's just that if, if I did it, anybody can do it. Trust me. Cause I am, uh, yeah, yeah. Trust me. If, if I can do it, you can do it. Believe me. It's, um, it, it's, you know, there's packages you can buy. What was that thing on TV, man? You could do a Pirelli tour. They go to Italy. Do a Pirelli hmm. tour. There you go. Really it's interesting. All, yeah, you'll get to pose all weird and, and, and goofy in front of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You can sit there and pretend like you're holding a thing up like everybody else does. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and then you can come back to the United States and be that guy that goes out to, you know, the Olive Garden and critiques the food. Like, yeah, this isn't real Italian food. Yeah. I've been to Italy. I know. <laughs> That's what crap Italy is supposed to look like. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't be that guy ever. But I hear a cat in the background. Is that your cat? That is, that is one of our cats. We have, I have three cats. Me and my wife have three. Jeez, uh, man. Three cats. Whoa. Yeah. And they just, you know, it started as one and then it was just like, you know, we just got another one, and then we got another one, and it's like, all right, that is, we are, we are at our cat max. Seriously though, can somebody have like, can someone not have too many cats? Yeah, you can have too many cats. Trust me. <laughs> trust, I think three is our limit. I think it depends on how big your house is, and um, yeah, that's the, the cat ratio is all dependent on the size of your year or where you live. So yeah, you can definitely have too many cats. <laughs> hey, yo, yo, it's your boy, El Shizzle. Drop a comment in the chat. How many cats you have? I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Just making oh, up. God, there. So, so cringy. <laughs> and it's live. It's there forever now. Yes, it is. Well, we don't have a whole lot of people in the chat right now. Anyways, the chat's been kind of dead for a little while. Hopefully, hopefully that changes. I mean, we just started, and it's pretty late though, so I don't really know. But yeah, I think this is going to be this is kind of like our experimental run here. Can you start a live stream at midnight? And you know, unless you're like, if you're not already like super established and famous, can you do this and get viewers? We shall see. I'm, I'm hoping. I, I'm really banking on the bored Twitter browser person coming through and just being like, oh, there's a there's a nice live. Let me click that link. That's that's how I get most of my readers. Like, you got to be bored enough to read my stuff. You might be glad you did. You might work the same. <laughs> voice. I don't know. Come on down and find out. <laughs> but the um, is, <clears throat> people in the chat, if you have any questions for me or Kay, please drop them below and let us know. As before, we will be happy to answer any questions that we get. So, yeah, let us know. Dude, have you ever thought about doing that on Twitter, being like, Ask me anything. Ask me, you know, Q and A, and then like stop um, because actually, you're surprised. Yeah, it. yeah. I, sorry, to interrupt, but uh, yeah, I think I have done that before plenty of times. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty fun. I like it whenever people ask me questions like, um, like, how you doing? Where you from? Uh, how old are you? Well, not too personal stuff, but I'll admit, I mean, I like it whenever people ask me like, what made you get started in, in, in the narrations in the first place? What was your first creep boss to this, that, and the other? I mean, it can get a little repetitive at times when people ask you the same question over and over again and you're given the same answers to the same question every time somebody asks you. But really, I guess it doesn't really matter at all because it's always a new person who wants to know. It's never like the same person each and every time. I mean, if yeah, it well, was, that, that would get pretty here. annoying. <laughs> I'm just flattered somebody takes time to ask. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. But no, what I was going to say, though, to finish out was like, I've never done that only because I'm always terrified like nobody's going to ask me shit. I'm always like... <laughs> yeah, ask me whatever you got, guys. Come on, hit me with your questions. And then, like, two days later, the tweets got, like, no fucking... It's got, like, one like and no fucking comments. Oh, I hate that so much. Like, 
uh, I tweet something out or like I post something, post something in the community tab that's like really important and it barely gets noticed at all whatsoever. It's like, what the hell am I doing wrong, guys? I know. It's like, come on, you know, and then it's like, I don't know. Show man. us I, some love. I I don't know what like, like I've broken it down before in the past. It's like, you know, tweeting is difficult because generally speaking, you know, Facebook is like where you know everybody kind of like usually like friends and family. Like you might have some extended social media friends on there, but <laughs> mostly it's like people you've been in the same room with at least once in real life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, and you know, other, you know, other, other social media platforms are not really so much for getting to know the per like Reddit's not really about getting to know the user. It's just more about, you know, the, the post itself, you know, that's kind of the star of the show. Twitter's like, yeah. I always, I always describe it as the, like walking into a room full of people that you don't know. And then a tweet is like, you just randomly saying stuff out loud and hoping that somebody with an earshot is like, <laughs> what, what yeah. would you say over there? What? Yeah. <laughs> It's like you um you walk into Walmart and you just shout out to everybody, "Hey everybody, I'm in Walmart right now." It's basically like yeah. that. Yeah, and except you know with Twitter, you're trying to like more like like when st- even starting conversations is like, so yeah, I uh, might have a book signing set up, and then it's like <laughs> nobody. Yeah, and nobody and that, that's shows not how forever it is. alone, man. The memes are coming in. Well, you know, kind of. I, I think. Some of the advice I've seen and some of the advice I've given, you know, has been like, you know, with tweeting, you want to make it like kind of an engaging question if you can, an engaging comment. Like I try to as best I can to just avoid like, you know, all right. So uh, I went shopping today, bought shoes, they fit, you know, because it's like there's not really anything for somebody to get in on with that. Like, okay, you bought shoes and they fit. Good for him. Like nobody. How do you add on to that? You know, I always try to find a way to put something out that can be built on. And and then when that gets no comments, then I'm like, damn. <laughs> uh, hello, Slumber Reads. How are you tonight? Oh, Slumber Reads, another guy. He's a he's a cool guy. He has a good channel. Oh yeah, and Mandy also has a good channel as well. Actually, uh, Mandy, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but you're actually a lot more well known on Twitter than you are actually with your videos. Like I've seen your tweets get like a lot of likes and I mean like a lot of likes and compared to your, 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 your yeah, I cannot say that for some reason. I don't know why compared to your, your YouTube channel. Why is that so hard for me to say? I don't know. Um, it's not, a, it's not really as, as big, so to speak. I don't know. Maybe just people enjoy hearing what you have to say and certain things like, like when it comes to Twitter, like I've seen a lot of stuff you post. It's pretty funny. Well, you know, one thing I always tell people is like, Platforms don't always cross connect. Like you know, I, I I know some people who have, you know, th- you know tens of thousands or even you know six figure you know sub counts on YouTube, and they have very small Twitter followings. Um, you know, so it doesn't always. I mean, I guess it just depends on what brought people to your content in the first place. Like if people love you as a YouTube content creator, then that's kind of what they're going to stick to. And I think it also depends on the style of content you do. If, if you have a personality page where yeah. you are, you are the part of the YouTube, you know, video, then you're probably more likely to get engagement on Twitter because people are watching your YouTube videos to see you do and say stuff. Whereas if your uh-huh. YouTube channel is just like, you know, regular content being presented just through your voice and through your editing skills, I guess, or whatever, then, yeah, they're getting what they need from that. Like, I don't know if they really need to know what you had for lunch and stuff like that. So I think it just uh, everything kind of has to, and, and I always say every platform kind of serves its own, like, form of art as well. You know, I always say, like, Twitter's great for writers, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and, they all kind of have their own kind of thing. For writers, I always say Twitter. I'm, I'm trying to think. I used to know, you know, I guess Deviant Art is probably great for, you know, artists, uh, things like that. And then, of course, they probably have some. YouTube is great for, like, yeah. a lot of people who sing. So, yeah, everything kind of has its own thing. And, of course, you know, if you're a model or, or something like that, you know, Instagram's your place. Yeah, yeah. You know, try something new on a, on a different, different platform or maybe – if you want to try something new on YouTube, essentially, which, you know what, Kay, that speech right there, it really inspired me because you know what I'm going to do. 
What are you going to do, Lance? I'm going to move away from the narration community. Just get out of it entirely. I'm going to go to the beauty community. That's right. I'm going to become one of those makeup applying channels and try to look sexy and beautiful. Well, you're off to a great start. Yeah. So, there you go. Hard part's already done, man. You just got to just gotta make the channel now. Gotta I'll call it, it Lance's creepy makeup. Are you yeah, going to wear your mask? Are you going to wear the mask? <laughs> yeah, wear the mask while I just like apply a, a bunch of bunch of makeup shit to the whole thing. So it's basically just you smearing makeup on your mask. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> you know what? There was a time in my life when I, when I would have been like, that would never catch on. But then I heard about like this mukbang shit and stuff. And I'm like, you know what? Anything can be anything. Damn it. Oh, the the mukbang thing? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, you can. You know what? If, if mukbang can be a thing, go do your beauty channel with your mask. It just might catch on. I don't think anything is off the table anymore. <laughs> I think mukbang can just prove uh, that nothing <clears throat> is out of reach for anybody. Mandy says, "Call it lipstick with Lance." <laughs> that's pretty nice, Mandy. Yeah, I might look into that. It's pretty. That's a nice thing. Um, <clears throat> with the whole mukbang channels, um, I'll admit, I. Uh, Despite me joking about the whole beauty community thing, the one thing I can never understand that's so entertaining is the mukbang channels. Like, what is so entertaining about watching somebody eat? I don't get it, dude. I like I said, that's one thing. Like, I get it. I'm I'm freaking old, man. A lot of crap that I see on the internet, I <laughs> don't quite get. But at least I can usually kind of try and understand. Like, a, at least see its entertainment value for others. I can be like, all right, this isn't for me, but somebody else probably likes it. Yeah, it's that, like it's like behold, this is the new entertainment for your kids. Not TV, not video games, not music. Just watching somebody sit on their ass, stuffing their face, and making that dank YouTube ad revenue. But you know, I can't be mad at them for doing it though. It's like holy shit, we live in a time where you can get successful recording yourself, eat, you know, eating. Oh, I hey, am not Spooky Boo's here. Oh, Spooky Boo in the house. Hello, Spooky Look, Boo. I'm... What is up? I... I'm not bitter at all that people are making money off that mukbang shit. If, some, if there's an audience for it and you provide an e for it, goddamn go for it. I just don't get it. I don't get the appeal. <laughs> well, people say the same thing about ASMR videos, but I can see definitely see the appeal with those, those kinds of videos. I'm not going to lie. I watch the ones of people getting like, um, you know, they have these ones where people get like these head massages and stuff like that. Like these oh, yeah, those videos. ones. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you feel I like can you're going through the actual it. thing. Dude, there, there's this one guy, um, he is a, uh, a Turkish barber, and he, I watch his videos all the damn time just to chill. Like, this guy, just watching him shampoo and massage somebody's head, I'm just like, holy crap, if I ever go to Turkey, that is like my first, that is my first stop. Well, you know, Dr. Creepin lives in Turkey right now. You can probably just ask him what it's like there. <laughs> Maybe he can oh, give you a clear, solid answer about the whole thing. Hell yeah, Dr. Creepin, if you, if you ever hear this video, check it out, man. Look, I think his name is like Anil Katmak, I think is his right. YouTube channel. Tell I got to come over down here in New Orleans and, and hook the boy up with shampoo. <laughs> and that, yeah, and hopefully, massage. hopefully that can happen. Uh, hello, Evil Outcast. Um, what did you miss? Not much, man. We've just been shooting the shit, talking randomly, making jokes, talking about Jeff the Killer, all that good stuff. And head massage. Uh, yeah, yeah, and sexiness in the shower. A lot of we've covered a lot of bases here. I mean, we're kind of like you know, like hey, if you guys want to hear anything in particular, just ask your questions, throw it out there. You guys can kind of drive this. Um, you guys can drive this garbage truck um, all you want, man. I will just <laughs> ride. I'll ride on the back and grab the cans off the street. And you guys can just just take it where you want it to go. <laughs> Except we're like a reverse garbage truck. We're actually like throwing the trash back out. <laughs> like here you go, yeah, people. Yeah. It's like the D the D garbage truck. It's like, no, I'm not taking taking your garbage. Take your own damn garbage. Nah. In your trash every day. You got the damn thing full. One thing. Oh, one more thing about mukbang channels. Something that I, I never understood was the whole. Um, okay, there are some mukbang channels out there. I don't even know if I'm if I'm saying this right at this point, but there are some out there that actually read creepy pastas while eating, and I don't know about you. But I don't How's see that? any entertainment in that. And this is coming from a creepypasta narrator of all things. Like, no. I'm sorry. Hearing somebody, like, munch on, I don't know, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, chimichangas or whatever while they're reading a random creepypasta from somebody. And they don't even credit them properly from what I've noticed. Uh, 
their, their mouths are full at the time. It's hard yeah, yeah, exactly, names. exactly. Like, what is so entertaining about this? It's so cringy. Well, like, I mean, I think it's kind of like, you know, the goal, I think, of a great scary story is to be like, okay, you can't eat while you're hearing it because it's so intense. Like, it's taking your... Uh, it's like that's kind of living that's kind of like a bad endorsement for the story like you know you're you're you, you're just like eating while you're eating it man it's like yeah it'll make you hungry hey yo yo guys in the chat tell me would you guys like to see me make a video of me reading a story while i'm like i'm slurping on spaghetti noodles let me know if you guys want me to want me to do that that'd be pretty awesome right i'll do it live on camera with the mask on i don't know how i'll yeah, do it but it. i'll find a way you just got to cut a mouth hole out, you know, and in and, and, and goes the fork, you know, you got it. <laughs> well, that's but a genius know, I, idea right there, man. I, but, you know, I'm also one of those people that, like, I don't have too many, like, super pet peeve type things. But one thing is I don't enjoy watching people eat, like, in person. Like, right. you have to be a clean eater. You know, uh, if for some reason, like I get so grossed out by sloppy eaters, and uh, you know, that's why. Uh, so I, I definitely like. I know that's not going to appeal to me that watching somebody eat on camera because I don't even like watching it so much in person. Yeah. You know? It's like those moments, like when you're going to like your date's house or whatever, like you're on a date with somebody, you're going to meet their parents and you're so concerned about how you eat in front of them. Like you might, you don't want to come off as disgusting towards them. So you try to eat as like, I don't know, properly, if you can call it, even call it that as much as possible, not trying to make it look gross at all. It's all about remembering those table manners, man. It's like, let me put my yeah. napkin in my lap. Let me, you know, yeah, let me, let me, let me do all that. I don't know, man. Cause I, I've always been kind of like, you know, the, let me, let me show you what you're going to get from, from the first minute here. I don't want to set anybody up for, uh, for failure. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but, but I, I'm a fairly, I'm a fairly like, I guess, um, mannered eater i guess you would say like i've never been of all the things that i got screamed at as a kid for being or doing like like bad table manners was never really like one of them so i think that's the uh -huh. one thing i it's the one gift i give to the world is you can sit across me and eat without losing your appetite yeah and there's some asmr channels actually who do the whole eating sounds thing which honestly i never liked that either it just the sounds of people eating even if it's ASMR, never caught on with me. Not at all. And I'm the kind of guy that likes it. It's so weird to say it, but I like it when I hear somebody whisper into the microphone, which one were, they, one were they about ASMR channels. It's like, it's so weird. Like you hear, you have like a parent or a friend walk into the room and they ask you what you're watching and you just say, Oh, I'm just listening to somebody, to some girl whisper into my ears. You see, I've never really watched those ones. I don't really know like the audio ones too. Like I just watched that that guy massage heads. Um, I, I I don't know. Maybe it might be relaxing to put your headphones in. I mean, I think some of the ASMRs are like supposed to like chill you out, you know, um, and kind of just like give you tingles and crap like that. I don't know, man. Maybe if I get a good set of headphones, maybe one night I'll just search up some. Uh, <laughs> some relaxing, some soothing ASMR and just, uh, but it's kind of cool to see like ASMR is kind of catching on. Like I remember like the first time I saw it, I was like, I don't know what the fuck this is, <laughs> you know? And then like it, it kind of just, it's kind of becoming more normal now. Like more people kind of know what it is. So I was like, I don't know what this is. It's like fucking porn. Like, I don't know what the fuck am I watching here? Like most people you know, say that it is, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't, uh, I don't know if I want this, <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, it's getting more common now. It's, you know, it's supposed to be just, I guess, you know, the uh, soothing this <laughs> voice going into your ear holes and just making you feel, making you feel reborn. I don't know. It's, it's like, no, don't let my kids watch this. This is too weird. I don't know. I just, like I said, I just stick to the guy and the head massages <laughs> and, and he doesn't even talk. It's well, no I'm sure, I'm sure he appreciates that, man. Even though he watch doesn't know who, who you him. are. <laughs> well, he might, he might be, he might be a fan. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny though. I remember when I was doing like a pro like projects for school or homework or anything that for that matter. Like whenever it came to me doing that kind of stuff, like I would just turn on an ASMR video by uh, I don't know if you guys know this ASMR artist. God, I don't know why people call it that, but whatever ASMR artist. Her name is Ting Ting ASMR, and she's a Chinese ASMR artist, and she's really, really good at at the whole tingly thing. Like her voice is perfect for it, and I really enjoy it. Uh, I listened to a lot of her videos while I was doing homework and projects and whatnot. It just really relaxed me. 
And I know plenty of people out there who watch ASMR and they say it just creeps them the hell out. Like they, they don't understand how it's so, so uh, great to most people. Like I can get the whole whispering thing just kind of creeps people out, but there's plenty of people out there that actually find it relaxing or even sexual as some people put it. I've seen some weird comments from people like that in the ASMR community or rather the fans and it's pretty bizarre, but even still, ASMR by itself can be really enjoyable if the right person listens to it. And much like a lot of things on YouTube, it's not for everybody. And ASMR is one of them. And Kay, yeah. we got so sidetracked. We were talking about Jeff the Killer, then we just moved on to mukbag channels, and then we just moved on to ASMR topics, or maybe it was just me throughout the entire thing. But I was uh, just we... letting you go, man. I'm like, you know what? Just, just talk about you. Talk about you, you tingles and your jingles and, and, and everything else. You know, <laughs> you tingle, mingle, your, jingle, thingle, ringle, bingle. This is your uh, it's your podcast, brother. I'm just a guest, so you have at it, man. I am just along for the ride. Talk about uh, mukbang, have at it. Oh, uh, your phone's buzzing on you, man. Oh, yeah, oh, that's crazy that you can, like, I got a notification, and it's like, that's crazy that that comes through. It's like, <laughs> on the, you, you would think the audio side of it wouldn't catch that. But yeah, that was, I hope that wasn't too loud for people watching. I hope that wasn't the case. That was the actually that was the um, alarm to say get back on track off the off the uh, mukbang there. That was, oh. the, uh, <laughs> that was the built-in feature there. It's like that's that's a sidetrack alarm right there. Uh, what is this? Uh, you two are funny. Thank you, Mandy. That's that's really appreciative. I love that you said that. Thank you. Mandy's so nice. She's always saying nice stuff about oh, me. Yeah, yeah. Mandy's, like, Mandy's really awesome. We get, we gotta invite her on a stream sometime. That'd be really nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I think she's um been looking to do more YouTube stuff. So I'm not gonna put I'm not gonna speak overly speak for her, but um, you know, definitely I would say reach out, connect, see what's up. Eva Lutcast says question mark. Um what what is he is he confused about something? What's going on, Eva Lutcast? What's on your mind? Right, wondering why we're talking about goddamn ASMR on a midnight horror podcast. Yeah, we just got really sidetracked and everything, man. That's just the way it is. Anyways, let's get let's get back to Jeff the Killer. How about we do that? We go. All right, go ahead. Now I am gonna ask you some questions about the story, and some of these I have asked you in past streams, but I think it's only fair that you do answer these questions again for the audience that's new to the channel. Hey, I'm 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 an open book. Hit me. All right, so let's see here. Um, when you first were writing the Jeff the Killer story, um, did you always intend to change Jeff's appearance, or did you always ever think to actually stick with the original um, design of the character? Well, I intended to change the way he got disfigured. Like that was always that was always part of the plan. So how you know his new appearance would kind of just automatically follow to to whatever seemed like the the best way to go about you know doing that so when the flare gun idea popped into my head and i said yeah that's that's the way i'm gonna go flare gun jeff then it just kind of became a matter of okay now how would how would somebody become disfigured from a flare gun and there you go so so no the, the idea at first was to change the way he was injured and then just follow suit appropriately with you know with, with how he appeared Hmm. All right, fair enough, fair enough. I can see that. Um, everyone's pointed this out to you, but people keep saying that you ripped off Two Face, much like how the original story ripped off the Joker. Like, what is your response to all that? Well, I mean, you know, here's the thing. I mean, uh, eventually something's going to be comparable to something else. I mean, uh, that's just. If you look at any kind of media out there, you know, you can always run it back and say, well, this was similar to that. And that looked like that. And, you know, it'll go on like that, you know, kind of forever. So I, I think it was inevitable that anything that's go that gets scarred down the side of its face now, you know, two faces, a very well-known popular character in the Batman universe there. So and it probably didn't help that, you know, <laughs> Jeff had already for years been compared to the Joker. So, like, everybody was already kind of conditioned to, like, okay, Batman villain. And so then when the injuries became, you know, comparable to a different Batman villain, of course, everybody just was easily able to shift because they were already in a Batman state of mind there. 
Oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. Are you a Batman fan at all? I'm just wondering about that one. I mean, I like Batman. I'm not like an obsessive fan. I don't think of any comic books too much, but I mean, Batman is probably the my favorite like DC panda uh, world there, I guess. Um, never really got into Superman too much. That's a shame, but, man. I'm a Superman guy all the way. I mean, I don't dislike. Let's put it this way: I don't dislike Batman. You know, I. Uh, so we'll just. Let it I don't. I. I am very much. Um, I'm very much pro Batman. Let him be his thing. Let him do his thing. Put on his bat suit. But, you know, I'm not. I'm not following his every move. Either. <laughs> yeah, not at all, man. Not at all. Um, <clears throat> has anyone ever asked you if you'd be willing to like do a crossover episode or some kind of episode or story where um. The original Jeff the Killer with the sliced mouth actually meets your version of Jeff the Killer. As I saw a picture of of uh, the two Jeffs actually together at one point in some fan art, and that got me thinking: Has someone ever actually asked Kay about that? Like, would the two ever actually meet in some kind of universe for whatever reason? Um, I would, you know, if if the original, you know, Sassure, somebody from back in the day with it reached out to me and said, let's do a fun, crazy, one-off, you know, story, you know, of that, then I would definitely be in. That's not, I don't think I would do that just like on my own, though. I don't think I would do that, no. But that would be a fun, that would be a fun collaboration with like the original, you know, creator of Jeff, you know, like um, kind of like a, a, a comparison of Jeff versus, you know. I would do it. I would do it under those circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I can totally see that happening. And speaking of, of the whole Jeff versus series, like, it became so, so common that with every one of those that was released, they always had to have that multiverse Jeff the Killer fight. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome, Evil Outcast. But um, it became, like, a common thing in the early days of Creepypasta where Jeff basically had to fight everyone in the universe from Slender Man, uh, the Rake, um... Who else? Who else? Oh, well, actually, this isn't part of the of the uh, creepypasta universe, but they even had him fight Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger at one point. And uh, oh yeah, even Jeff Laughing Jack at one point as well too. And I think even Squidward's suicide too. Like, are you kidding how do you me? Fight, how do you fight? Like, did he fight Squidward? I don't fucking get how you would fight Squidward's suicide. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm just picturing like Squidward's like his weapon of choice is his clarinet, and he's just like blowing it at Jeff. Like, and the sound waves are so loud, it it's like it's too much for his ears to handle. Just blows his head right off his shoulders. <laughs> that's his. That's Squidward's fatality move. His clarinet skills. <laughs> I, I think that uh, I you know I'm pretty sure that if you put Jeff the killer. And, you know, uh, up against anything like Freddy or Jason or Michael Myers, you would have a you would have a puddle of Jeff the Killer remains on the ground and, and any of those other killers just walking away like like Jeff at the end of the day, at least from my perspective and from my version and reboot and everything, is just a kid. You know, um, he doesn't have any kind of crazy powers or anything like that. Like, yeah, exactly. He doesn't get the, if he doesn't sneak up on you for the most part, like if he if you were waiting for him, he would not be a threat. Exactly. Uh, Circle Light says um, people like to think Jeff is some immortal being. LMF, LMAO. Yeah, I never got that. Why is it that people are always just assuming Jeff can't die? Like maybe it's just the whole fangirl mentality. Like they we can't have our pres our precious emo emo kid die. He has to live every time, no matter what happens, even if he's like burned alive in a house or impaled on a tree there were this that and the other like he has to survive 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 each and every time with no no scars no nothing well, he's got plenty of scars of yeah. well no i think <laughs> now to kind of maybe answer that from kind of a writerish kind of standpoint there for one i don't think anybody wants to put an ending to you know to the content like that one they may want to come back and write another one you know that that could serve as a sequel to the first one they wrote or you know maybe they don't want to have people come out and be like oh my god you killed Jeff dies at the end what a horrible story you know I don't know I mean I think the idea is to just keep it going especially with the way like you know those online horror stories kind of started out it was almost like you know it was passing the stick you shared it you know um, I, so I, I don't know if anybody wants to like kill him as much as they just want to write about his antics 
You right, know? right. So, uh, See, um, I can only think of one story where they actually did kill off Jeff the Killer, and that was actually in the Jeff the Killer versus Michael Myers story. And if you've seen the episode of Bad Creepypasta where they read the story, you can understand why. But if you haven't, I'll spoil it real fast because, honestly, who cares about spoilers to that story? It's Jeff the Killer versus Michael Myers, as if anyone's going to take that seriously. I mean, I wouldn't say maybe maybe it's a great read. I don't know. I ain't going to judge. It's, it's not. It really isn't. It really isn't. Believe me, I even read the story myself. It's not good. It's mm. basically Jeff and Mike get into a knife fight. It's stabbing and slashing all that shit and Jane's in the story. And apparently, they're, Jeff and Jane are together, even though Jane wanted to kill Jeff in the, in the original continuity. Well, look, look, if the, if the author of Jeff the Killer versus Michael Myers over here is just understand, I got no, I got no bad opinions of the story, man. I never read it. So, so you can uh, send your salt to uh, Lance there. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, re I'm really salty right now. <laughs> I'm so salty. You can oh, just said the salt coming off of me. If you guys want some salt, take it off of me right now. It's all yours. You get, you get some salt. You get some salt. Take all this salt off my hands and arms. You sound kind of salty. <laughs> yeah, I, I do actually. Yeah, I, was but just, I oh. never read the story. I, I couldn't tell you two things about Jeff versus Michael Myers, other than the fact that yeah. if it went down, like if the if the characters were you know calibrated to how they are in their respective universes, and you mashed them together, then Michael Myers would like take it would be over before it began. Yeah, exactly, exactly, man. Uh, Dark Vampira says. Uh, hey Lance, it's been a while. It's been a while of a stream. I'm playing Red Dead Two. Well, that's great. It's great, uh, Dark Vampira. It's nice to see you again. Um, yeah, it has been a while since I've done a stream. I don't really do it do it as, do it as often as I should, really. Although that is going to change this summer. I will be doing more live streams, more podcasts, and hopefully, I'll bring in more and more guests at, with each passing stream. And maybe we can do more than just talk and shoot the shit. Like maybe we can play like I don't know, Cards Against Humanity with. A few other people like that'd be pretty neat but for right now i'm trying to do a little bit of a professional stream right now where i'm just talking to an amazing author k ben and kellum and about his story jeff the killer what's going on dark vampira good to see you again good to see you again sing it no that's all you get there you go <laughs> wow what a verse I always picture something like, okay, this is going to sound really stupid, or maybe not, depending on how you look at it, but I always thought about writing, writing like, or doing a creepypasta musical. Like, I don't know why, but for some reason, I think that a creepypasta musical video could actually work, where it's a big, scary story, but it's mixed in with, well, musical. A musical. Uh -huh. So it's a basically like a horror, horror musical, in a way. Like, your guess is as good as mine how that would turn out, but I would love to actually give that a try one day and see how it turns out. Well, man, look, you do that. I'll, um, I will totally, I will, I will totally watch the video. <laughs> uh, I can't promise you, I can't promise you a like, but no, um, I mean, <laughs> if it's something that you're like motivated to do, man. Then, uh, shit, I mean, I say go for it, you know, I mean, it would have to be a video, obviously, because you can't really, like, just write a song in prose and expect people to know how the hell it goes. Uh, ah, like that, you just made a good rhyme right there. Man, I'm just, I'm knocking them out of the park tonight. K-Banning smell them, says Mandy Mortem. K-Banning smell Yes, I actually, um, one of my nicknames was, used to be smell em, kill em. I don't know if that was an insult nickname or a term of endearment, and I still don't. That is now official. Hashtag smell and kill them. Get that trending, folks. We got to get the name out. I'm scrolling up through the comments. See if I missed anything. Yeah. Let's see. Got a good, good, strong chat going on. You guys keep it going, man. I am finally back to where I can look at it again. Da, da, da. <laughs> keep the chat going, uh, yeah, guys. Cool. This is great. Um, excuse me. Um, Okay, guys, if you have any questions, once again, for me or Kay, make sure to list them in the comments below, and we will do our best to answer them. So, if you have anything, just let us know. We're always open to questions, no matter what it is. Ask Kay about his Jeff series. Ask me about anything. 
just don't make it too personal. You know, I don't want to answer too much personal questions. Oh yeah. The Jeff series. Yes, it is a series. Um, that, that is quite true. Uh, there are more of them. There are more of them out there. I think, uh, I know Lance, you, you're familiar with like uh, scars of corruption and stuff like that. Absolutely. But, uh, yep. There's more. So, uh, yeah. And with if that series, Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, if you didn't get your fix with 2015, then, uh, yeah, there, there, there's there's more. So much more. Uh, have I played RDR2, Red Dead Redemption 2? Gosh, I freaking love this game so much. I bet you do. But no, actually, I have not. I played the first one a while ago, like years ago, but I never actually beat it. Uh, I don't have a PS4. I really want one, though. And actually, this is a good subject to talk, to talk about real fast. Um, even though I don't have a PS4, I have an Xbox One. And it wasn't even originally mine. You see, years back, my brother came home with the Xbox One saying, Lance, I'm sorry, man, but I couldn't resist. I had to spend money today. And he brought home a big-ass Xbox One console, the first model. He's like, I just couldn't resist it, man. I had to. And, of course, he bought Call of Duty. Um, after that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, after that, he played it for a little while, but then he just lost interest in it. So he stopped playing it for about a year or two. And when we went to his graduation dinner uh, celebration, I asked him, are you ever going to play your Xbox One again? He's like, no, nah, probably not. He's like, can I have it, please? I'll be your best friend. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> But uh, he agreed to give it to me. We shook hands on it. So now that obviously cements the deal. It's like now that Xbox One is my Xbox One. But there was a catch. He told me that in order for it to be officially mine, I had to buy a controller for it. Whether it be pre-owned or a brand new one, I had to buy my own controller. So I'm like, okay, sure, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Because he was giving his away to his girlfriend's little brother because he needed one. So just today, actually, I um, went to GameStop. I picked up an Xbox One controller, and with that, I picked up the uh, remake of Resident Evil 2, because I've been wanting to play that so desperately. And while I originally wanted to play it on the PlayStation, even though I don't have the PlayStation, I thought the Xbox would be another good choice, because I kind of wanted to try both versions and see how they compared to each other, gameplay and control-wise. So, hopefully, um, the Xbox is a good port, and I'll like that one as much as the PS4 one whenever that time comes. And it's actually funny, Kay, um, before we even started the stream, I actually had the game inside the console. I was having it installed because I wanted to play a little bit of it before we started streaming, but the installation process took way too long and I wasn't able to. But that's okay. I can always do it after the stream. And maybe I'll give my thoughts about it. And I also thought about making like a video about the game as well because I'm the kind of guy who played the hell out of the original game on PS1 a while ago. Like, Not like back when it first came out, obviously, but like years ago. Like, I was obsessed with it. It's become my favorite classic Resident Evil game. Well, not my favorite, actually. Scratch that. My second favorite classic Resident Evil game. And I think a while ago, you actually mentioned to me that RE3 was actually your favorite one in the series. Is that right? Resident Evil 3, absolutely. That was my favorite. Well, that was my favorite up until then. Like, I really loved Resident Evil 4. And then I liked Resident Evil 5. And that's kind of when I stopped. That's kind of when I stopped playing them. I think I played 6. And just didn't really have time to to dedicate to to it as I had with the other games, and just kind of fell. I mean, but yeah, I mean, like three and four were probably my two favorite from the entire series easily. And then, but I've always been a huge like Silent Hill was always my jam. Like Silent uh, Hill, yeah, I've beaten the first game. I never played any of the other games though. I kind of wanted to try Resident Evil. Wait, sorry, Silent Hill two out, but uh, that's a little too pricey for me at the moment. Although I heard the PS2 port's the, still the best one to this day. Not even the PS3 port can really hold a candle to it. I like Silent Hill 2. is probably my favorite of the Silent Hill games, matter of fact. So I would definitely say that's one. Uh, if yeah, you yeah. haven't played it yet, um, look. <clears throat> I hear it's like the most popular one out there, actually. Um, I've seen a lot of creepypastas based off Silent Hill 2. Not Silent Hill 2, but just the game, <clears throat> the game franchise as a whole. And why not? It's pretty cool. Uh, 
I, I think I ain't gonna lie to you, dude. When Skyrim came out, that kind of just became my entire life for like a very long fucking time. <laughs> I had never played Skyrim though, not once. Oh man, I mean, part of me wants to say don't because you're gonna get addicted, and then another part of me is like wants to say do it because you're missing out on on an absolutely fantastic fucking game. <laughs> I'm sure I am, but I think I'll, I might just avoid Skyrim just for that addiction factor. The same way I did, I did with Minecraft. I refuse to play Minecraft knowing how addictive it can be. And just, well, honestly, even though I heard it's really addictive, the game by itself looks kind of boring. But of course, that's just me saying saying that without actually playing it. I'm sure if I, if I did pick up a, a controller and tried to play it, whether it be on a PC or a console, I would most likely, would most likely get addicted to it like like that. Bam. But if there's one... what I'm... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go first. <clears throat> but if there's one game franchise that I will never get tired of, it's the Metal Gear Solid franchise. And I still love that game series to this day. And I'm actually playing the HD collection now, going through MGS2 again, which isn't really my favorite entry in the series, to be honest. Really, it's between that one and four, which one I think is the worst one, but I think if I ever play five, because I heard that one's like unanimously hated by a lot of fans, that might take the top spot in the worst game in the franchise. I never really got into the Metal Gears, man. Um, besides the one on the Nintendo from like a million fucking years ago, but uh, <laughs> that was that was about it. That's not even the canonical version. <laughs> no, it no, was no, for no. me. It was the only well, version for me. Yeah, yeah but the... for most people, the canonical version is actually the MSX for uh, games on the. Uh, that it was like only released in Japan, but then it was ported over to the uh, PS3 and PS2 uh, <clears throat> versions of Metal Gear Solid 3. Which cool they added those in there. Probably should have done that a little bit earlier though for the series, just to get just so just so fans can get like caught up on the series. But whatever. But what I would love to see, I would love to see like MGS One. Sorry, not Metal Gear Solid. Uh, Metal Gear One and Metal Gear Two, the eight uh, bit games, actually get like full HD remakes. Like, that would be an awesome idea. Just so fans can actually play uh, Snake's Journey well, <clears throat> the way it should be, I guess, um, shown to the, to, the, to the audience, I guess. You, you all about that, yeah. Um, I am a diehard Metal Gear fan, man. I just, I can't get enough of it. It's great. You know what I'm really into right now, dude? What's and, that? Uh, and it is so fucking weird because I hadn't thought about this in years. But I'm in that damn Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links game right now. <laughs> and I am fucking addicted. It is like, I, you know, I, I kind of missed the Yu-Gi-Oh! craze because I think it came out like in 2000. I was already like 20. Around then. Time, so. Around then, yeah. I, I was one of those kids that was obsessed with the game as a kid, even though I sucked at it. But I've gotten better as years have gone on. Like, I still I still occasionally play the card game. Not as much as I, as I used to, but I do have a better understanding of the rules and I have a good time whenever I play it. Yeah, I mean, I, I only played the tabletop cards actually when I was in the army. Like, we nerded out more in the fucking army than I ever had in my entire life. People hear that and they're like, you know, but I played more D&D in the army, played more Magic the Gathering and, and crap like that than anywhere else in my fucking life. And that's where I had some friends teach me how to play, like, Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And I liked it. I liked the mechanic of the game so much better than I did magic the gathering because it was just so fast you know magic's all about getting out land cards and all this other kind of shit i love just the quickness of the game and um and the themes of the decks you know and, and stuff like that i really liked it so i don't know and then somebody told me about the cell phone app so i got it and uh it's actually uh it, you know it'll either it'll, it will enrage you and delight you at, at the same fucking time so i don't know it's a good game building so i, I like it <laughs> It's great to hear, man. Um, yeah, we got some we got some comments that we actually missed a little while ago. Um, All right, well, let's, let's get to them. Uh, K Banning, when what is the next? Sorry, when is the next part of the Jeff the Killer Saga coming? All right, it says Evil see. Outcast. Evil Outcast. Where is that? Oh, oh here we go. Okay, when the, okay, so I am working on it right now. There, Evil Outcast, and for everybody else who is wondering that I, I get asked that you know um you know every once in a while like when coming um it is about i would say close to being halfway written um 
I wanted to have it out a long time ago, uh, probably about like two months ago. You know, if I would have set a deadline for myself, would have been when I would have wanted it to be out. But unfortunately, you know, it's like, um, you know, I got to not only make time to write, but then I also have to be, you know, kind of like make sure I'm motivated to write when I make the time to write. And sometimes it, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it uh, just doesn't come out that way. But I am working on it. It is coming, I promise you. Um, the next one is going to be Randy, Randy's story. So um, it's coming. It's in the <laughs> work. It will, it will be here soon. Um, Randy! Circa Light asks, Banning, can you comment on Jessica from your Jeff the Killer series? I, I can comment on her, absolutely. What would you like to know about in Jessica? I don't know who this character is yet. I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> she is a character from the Lou entry, if, if that's the Jessica that, that Circa is talking about. Yeah, uh, what would you like to know about her, Circa? Ask, ask away to Benning K. Look at you rhyming over there. I'll become a hip-hop channel, man. I'll, I'll become bigger than Mr. Black Pasta. Hey, yo, man, I'm calling you out for shizzle. God, I'm, I'm I'm so cringy tonight. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just keep trying to rap, man. You just kind of like, just kind of like, just. I don't have it in me, man. I'm not like that. It, I don't have any, any flow, you know. All right, let's see here. That didn't um, count, by the way. Okay, so Jessica, while well, while I wait and see if Circa has a more specific question, but um, I will say that the the. The character that she's referring to um, is Jessica. Oh, here we go. Well, just where she came from, what she like. I'm not sure. I'm just really curious. And what she's doing with the film. All right. So without giving away spoilers, um, Jessica Lum is the character's name. And she is Lou's girlfriend in his entry. <laughs> and she is... Where did she came from? She didn't really come from anywhere. She's a completely original character to, I guess, my Jeff verse. Um, and... She's kind of like Lou's girlfriend slash social media motivator, life coach type person, I guess. Um, what's she like? Uh, well, from what, I, from what I've got built about her in my head, and of course, without giving away, you know, spoilers, um, she is motivated and driven, and she is kind of the taskmaster to Lou's you know, uh, I don't know, uh, laziness. I don't, he's not really lazy, but you know, she's the one that kind of keeps him on track, man. You know, when Lou's, uh, when Lou's sitting around, not, uh, not getting shit done, man. Um, Senator. And what is she doing with the films when she records? Phone buzzed again, bro. I know. I'm telling you, man, that, that is the, um, that is Jessica Lum from the Lou story trying to, trying to hack into my phone and stop me from telling her secrets here. Oh, she's a um, hacker too. Imagine that. What is she doing with the film when she records Lou? That is, that is to be determined. Um, like I said, I can I'll answer anything except the spoilers. Um, I don't know if the films are going to come in to the storyline so much later, but you know everything kind of has a device to it. Everything's kind of there for a reason. So uh, stick around, <laughs> stick around to find out what she's doing with the films. Also be revealed. Does Jeff the Killer die in Endgame? Uh, well, just... Where's that? Does Jeff the Killer die in Endgame? Um, do you mean like the the last story? I guess uh, I'm just making a joke, man. Endgame. Oh, you're Avengers... I thought you were reading. God damn it, Lance! I thought you were reading somebody's comment, dude. I'm like, I was like scrolling around for that. I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? Like... no, no. Man, messing me up. Derailing my already fragile concentration here. Get your eyes checked, uh, old man. <laughs> yeah, really. Circus says, yeah. I'll keep my eyes. Well, oh, thank you. Yes, definitely stay um, stay engaged. And uh, yeah, there is definitely more to come. Like the story will, I will, I, I have to conclude the series at this point, whether it's another three or four or whatever amount of entries it takes to do so. It's kind of like past that point of no return. Uh, I, I'd go crazy if I just walked away from it. Like if I was like, eh, you know, no, I, it would, I'd, I'd have to kind of finish it out. I, I mean, I kind of committed to that when I did scars of corruption. It's like, well, here we go. It's going to be kind of a series. Yeah. I was, I was hate it whenever like an author has like this really good idea for a series and 
they're writing the first few entries, but then they, they just stop out of nowhere and decide to just quit and just never come back to it ever again. I hate that, but I can understand why they would do something like that. Maybe they just get like bored of it, or maybe they just got sick of the fan of the fan base constantly talking about it. Like, I don't know, something like that. Like, it's always something like this that just annoys me. And I've seen plenty of people actually do that kind of thing. I'm not going to name names, but there have been some authors out there that had these good ideas for series, but never followed through on them. They just quit out of nowhere. Even though... Well, that happens, though. though. Really should. But, you know, like, once again, like, as a writer, I can tell you, like, that is... That's kind of why it's really risky to start a series you know, on a public platform. Like if you're writing a series, you know, to publish traditionally and you've just got your notes at home, that's fine. Uh, but when you start, or if you write them all at once and then just roll <laughs> them out like a little bit at a time, that's also fine. But when you're releasing them as you create them, yeah, you gotta, you gotta really be, if they, you know, cause you want them to get popular. You want people to read them. You want the readers to say, we want more. That's obviously the goal. Um, but, then, like I said, if once that happens, it's like, all right, well, now you kind of got to now you kind of owe it to the people who have loyally stuck through it. And, you know, now you kind of got to finish it. So I always say, like, make sure, you know, writing a series, you know, when I wrote the Tobit series, man, that shit was daunting. That was over the course of four years. And like you start to you, even though you don't have a deadline and you don't have investors waiting or you don't have a publicist sitting there saying, dude, you know, you're about to breach a contract if you don't put out another piece of work. Even though you don't have any of that, you still have yourself to do. And I can tell you, like, if I took too long between Tobit chapters, <laughs> and stuff, I became my own asshole agent. And I was just like, fuck, I need to write this next Tobit shit that, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, taking on a series is, it's a commitment. And you gotta be, you know, you gotta kind of be wanting to do it. Oh yeah, most definitely. The same also applies to uh, narrators as well. If they want to narrate a series and actually intend on finishing it, you know, and that's why I always say Creeperoni is such an incredible narrator because she read oh yes every single damn one of those Tobits. And like I, I salute Creeperoni. That is that takes a lot of time and effort, and she managed to do it. Like I applaud her for that. Good job, Creeperoni. Even yeah, though you're not yeah. really watching this, but whatever. I applaud you, Creeperoni. Creeperoni made it look easy, man. Creeperoni made that shit look easy. I'm like, I don't think I could sit down and read my entire Tobit series out loud. <laughs> and that's without doing accents and voices and you know editing and blending. Jesus, I mean, I wouldn't want to imagine the amount of like repetition that. I'm just picturing you. I'm just picturing you like reading that to your kids as a bedtime story. Okay, kids, I got a really, really long story for you. Like, Chapter gonna, one. Your, your bedtime is now at 3 p.m. a week from now. So here's your here's your story. <laughs> Circa Light says, you're very thorough with your writing and engaging. Kudos. Thank you, Circa. I, I appreciate that deeply. Um, I appreciate everybody who really, you know, likes the my, my Jeff the Killer 2015 role there because it, it's, you know, yeah. It's uh, it's always kind of a roll of the dice when you take on those types of, of stories because, you know, they already have a built-in reputation, some of it great, some of it bad, you know, and, and you're kind of taking all that baggage with you uh, when you when you start your own kind of spinoff project with it. But if, you know, one thing I did with like Scars of – starting with Scars of Corruption and it's still kind of the ongoing thing, and anybody that's, you know, read – you know, the uh, spin pasta sequels over there is one of the weird complaints I always heard, or it wasn't really a complaint. It was always more of just like a commentary on almost every Jeff the Killer attempt that existed out there. Um, mine included was always that, you know, it doesn't matter how good the story is. If it includes Jeff, it's going to suck. So yeah. when I started with Scars of Corruption, like I'm like, Jeff has yet to be in a single damn one of them. Uh, and I was just kind of like, how can I work with that? Like, how can you have Jeff the Killer without Jeff the Killer? And then I'm just like, let <laughs> me try. A fake, have a fake Jeff the Killer, an imposter. Well, not even that, but just like the, the legacy is more powerful than the character in many ways. So that's... Yeah, yeah. You basically you know, had, him, had him mentioned throughout the entire series at this point, just not actually show him. Exactly. And, and you know, with Scars of Corruption, I didn't know if that was going to be a series 
or a sequel or what. I just know that when my friend Kevin Tierney wrote um, Jane the Killer 2017, uh, he entitled it, it's kind of a, an homage, I got kind of inspired to go back to, because, uh, you know, he wrote that one kind of based in uh, the Mandeville, you know, uh, 2015 universe. So yeah. that, that motivated the shit out of me. And I said, all right, well, let me, uh, let me go ahead and revisit it. Because I had thought about doing a sequel forever. People had talked about, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> the other characters. I was going to, I was going to ask you actually, Kay. Um, yeah. Sorry. I, I hate to keep interrupting you every time we, I have to bring up a question, but, uh, no, we're um, here for the questions. Yeah, I was going to ask you actually. Um, when writing Jeff the Killer 2015, did you ever intend on making this a series? Absolutely not. Um, it was, and I'm going to tell you, up until around the time Kevin, you know, contacted me about reviewing and giving feedback on his James story, I had never fathomed going back to uh, to the Jeff the Killer 2015. Um, you know, is it was kind of a desire. It was kind of a, like a what if could be, but the motivation just wasn't there. And so, no, and I never intended it to be more than just, you know, the, the Jeff the Killer 2015, that's what it is. And that was supposed to be its own thing. And then, but of course, you know, Tobit was never meant to be, you know, the first, the, the demon Tobit of Delphia, which I wrote as the very first uh, story, it was never meant to have any sequels or spinoffs or tie-ins or anything like that. It was a one-off story. And then I wrote, um, you know, for Love and Hot Chocolate, and I decided to use, to reference Tobit in it. And then I just kept fucking going and came the rest of them. But, I always like it whenever the, whenever an author like, references their other stories inside their own current works. Well, for example, one I can think of um, is, for example, uh, Stephen King, when he wrote Misery, he had a brief section where The Shining was actually referenced at one point in the story where uh what what's the girl's name in the story the the crazy girl uh Annie Annie Wilkins right right um she references the Paul of the events of the ending of uh, of uh, The Shining when the Overlook Hotel was blown up she talks about that apparently it was a well-known documented case and apparently in that universe it's the same as in Misery which oh was, yeah, well, of course. You know, if you really, if you like that, then just read the Dark Tower, and your mind's gonna get blown because literally, he, uh, in tons of his work, gets tied in together, and a lot of characters cross over. So, um, yeah, Stephen King's kind of got a one universe kind of thing going there. Um, not all of his stories necessarily fall into it, but a lot of, especially with the Dark Tower, a lot of stuff ties in together. Uh, Insomnia ties into Dark Tower big time, uh, stuff like that. So. Yeah, if you like that, then you will like the Dark Tower. Mm. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, quickly on the, on the whole uh, Jeff the Killer series, actually. Um, of course, you weren't intending on making this a whole series, but what was the? How did the idea of the story of the series actually come to you? Like, how how did you like brainstorm all these ideas that ended up being in the final product of your of your work? Like, I'm just trying to imagine. Like there's a lot of great unique ideas throughout this entire series, and I'm just wondering how long it took you like to think all this up. Like, did it just come to you? Was it something that you actually planned when you decided, okay, I'm gonna write a series, and this is what this is what's gonna happen? Oh God, no! I can't. I, I wish I was that fucking good. No, um, I am not a plotter at all. You know, um, I, you know, I always say like, you know, I mean, Jeff Lewis is on fifteen. Of course, that was. You know, that was a reboot of something that was already out there. It wasn't my, you know, character. It wasn't, you know, all I was really doing was adding to, you know, and building upon an existing platform. So, you know, that was just a matter of like looking at things to change, to add up, to kind of grow it up a little bit, you know, make it more believable. So that was just more of enhancing and kind of swapping out ideas um, that played better with each other in a realistic setting. But like Scars of Corruption, I just had this idea to present it, you know, with, with like the snippets from newspapers and magazines and internets and like adding stuff like that in throughout the actual plot of the story. But that idea was just to really talk about the aftermath of, you know, the Jeff the Killer 2015 incident. That was really, that's all it was supposed to be is like, you know, what what's happening with these characters now and, you know, what became of them years down the line. And that's why I bring, you know, that's why I mentioned like Lou wrote a book and Randy came out of witness protection and, uh, you know, 
then I introduced Jane in there and the way I ended it was kind of an open ending. And I'm like, okay, well now I know the next one will be, will incorporate Jane. And at that point I was like, all right, I'm just going to kind of just take the entire, you know, Jeff, the killer kind of, you know, universe and all the characters kind of associated with it, Jane, the killer and Nina, the killer and, and all of them. And just kind of see where I can take, you know, the, these concepts and just string it out. So that that's kind of the broad overview. But no, I don't have, I never sit down with anything besides a vague idea of like the ending. You know, the only thing I really can tell you most of the time is like how it's going to begin. And then it's just sort of like a runaway train, whatever, whatever happens with it happens with it. Huh. Well, huh. that's interesting to to know, Kay. Actually, it's really interesting. I always thought you were like an improv kind of guy, and you just you just thought about the stuff as you went along. Yeah, that's what I do. Oh, oh sorry. I can't, maybe I just didn't word that right. I don't know. Blah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, like I said, you have to kind of have a vague, but you do kind of have to have a vague structure of how you want it to look, um, just so you don't lose your mind exploring all the different possibilities that make them. You got to kind of know like how you want it to frame, but yeah, I've never sat down there and been like, all right, there's going to be six characters and this one's going to do that. No. I mean, a lot of times the characters just pop up, you know, because of another character that I've already written in there. And I'm like, you know, this guy needs a foil or, you know, this person needs, you know, something to enhance this character. Um, and that's where you got like Dalton and Simon, like in the Scars of Corruption one there. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, what was the inspiration behind those guys? Are they based off real people you know or people that you've seen on television or something like that? Like, what was their their character about? I mean, how did they, how did they come to you essentially? Well, I don't really know. I mean, I don't know how they they really come. I usually like with Dalton. I wanted to have kind of someone who existed outside of the, I don't know, the sensationalism of the case. Like I wanted to kind of present this cop that is, he's over, he's over being a cop in the, you know, uh, let's get out there and fight some crime kind of thing. He's definitely just kind of going through the motions of whatever in his life. Um, he's not impressed by, you know, what's going on, but he'll still do his job, you know, to the best of his ability. And he still looks at things very seriously uh simon you know was i wanted a i wanted a foil for uh you know for dalton i love that kind of dynamic when you have like you know like the the serious and and, and the silly character and they and they kind of have to work together but you know they work together well it's not like one's just pissing the other one off all the time but it's more like they kind of come together to create a more uh complete dynamic between the two uh, so yeah, I wanted to have it kind of, and I also kind of wanted to make an interesting cop character. Like most people, uh, you know, you go to fi a lot of fiction and the cops are usually, you know, you got the hard boiled detective, which is kind of what Dalton came out as. Um, so I wanted like, I don't know, like, like just kind of a, you know, a, a really different approach on yet a, and still have him as a competent and dedicated, you know, investigator, but not like the super, you know, uh, cop-like cop. And that's where I kind of got Simon. I, kinda, I, I, I tried to think of, you know, just somebody who's really good at their job but also doesn't take the bullshit seriously. Um, and that's kind of Simon. You know, he just, uh, well, he, he, yeah. It's about the best way I can summarize that, I think. He's not just Simon. He's Simon Lyman. Yes, yeah, that that came out in nowhere. I don't know the, the rhyming thing. I think I did that to just show like he just the, the guy just likes what he is. Like he's, I think that was meant to demonstrate like his just kind of, kind of confidence of self. You know, it's like he intentionally changed his name to rhyme, and you know that. And at one point, Don's like, "Why the hell would you do that?" And he's like, "To make it rhyme." You know, that was <laughs> kind of what I was going with. Like, there's this guy that just you know. He is that in the moment, you know, kind of character. And I felt like he played well into the atmosphere of the story. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a good idea, Kay. I think I'll change my name from to Lance Pants. Yeah, there you go, Lance that's Pants. a good one. Lance Pants. That has a has a nice, nice little ring to it. I, agree. I got the, I got I the pants, man. 
Change your yeah yeah change, change change your Twitter handle. We'll see we'll see how dedicated you are. Let's see if Lance Pants shows up on there. Lance Pants well, dance. <laughs> um, Circa Light says I loved Simon. Thank you, thank you, Circa. I I I loved writing him. Uh, he was a fun character. Hey, Mr. Creepy Boss actually liked uh, playing him, didn't he? Yeah, MCP had had um it really liked that was one of his favorite characters. He told me was Simon. Um, and and what I liked about the Simon character was just that. I was afraid that he was going to come out too charactery, and readers can tell that. Like when you're writing a character that's meant to be the funny character, so they just act like a fucking asshole all the time. Like people are like, "Oh no, you know, you're just forcing." Them. Like I want, I had to tap into something. So yeah, I mean, Dalton, Simon, all the fucking characters—they're all just basically refreshed impressions from either, you know, from something that I've seen or known or, or dealt with at some point in my life. Because obviously, that's where we everything from we don't know it yeah we encounter it. he's um, also a fan of homestar runner too <laughs> yes he is I, I i'm really glad that people got that reference i was like what is the perfect dated reference that's not too dated and i was like <laughs> fucking homestar i used to love that shit back uh like in the early 2000s or whatever when i first came. i used to watch the shit out of some homestar runner i actually never saw homestar runner not once well you missed the fuck out lance because it was good it's good uh. stuff Sorry, I, I'm too, uh, what is it? I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't know. You're, you're never too anything to go on homestarrunner.com and just fucking start watching shit, man. It's like that with Salad Fingers, you know? I don't know. See, Salad Fingers, I don't, I don't know. I couldn't tell you what Salad Fingers is. I've heard it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so before we, oh, here we go. Simon was a break in tension. There we go. Thank you, Circa. Circa actually categorized that better than I think I could have. Simon was a break in tension, like a good comedic breakaway. Absolutely. I mean, the story was, the first Jeff Killer was way too, it was very dark throughout, like my version of 2015. And that's another thing that I didn't want to do with any sequels down the line. It's like, you know, I, I didn't want it to be just dark from beginning to end, you know. So I liked the fact that I was able to put the character of Simon in there and have him be an entertaining, believable addition to the cast of characters and still serve that purpose of kind of making the story a little less, you know, uh, dim. Yeah, it's a shame he was killed off so early, though. Like, a lot of people really like this character and you just killed him off like that. Like, you're trying to pull, like, a George Double R. Martin on us. We kill off, like, the best characters. <laughs> Well, I mean, okay, so to anybody who hasn't read Jeff the Killer, Scars of Corruption... Um, oh, shit, disregard. I just spoiled that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just disregard that comment, uh, but... Oh, but, no, um, what no. have I done? What have I done? Um, killing a character is never... Killing a character that you like to write is never fucking easy. You know, when, when the Tobit series started getting down to the you know last couple of chapters and I had to start, you know... Uh, approaching the idea of, of whacking some of my characters it, it was difficult to write it in a way that still paid the proper kind of respects to that character and to not you know and and to kind of respect the bond that the readers had developed with those characters um you, you kind of got to do it in good taste um uh, while still keeping with the genre so uh, so yeah i mean killing simon was not um if there was any other way to do it, I think he would still be around. But, um, you know, I needed Dalton more and somebody had to go. So, sorry, Simon. You were, uh, you, you, the world did not deserve you. Well, hey, at least um, you had him appear in flashbacks. And I like what you're doing with all the characters. Um, uh, you're giving them actual more development by having them appear in flashbacks. Like what their lives were like before, before the whole events of 2015 kicked off. Like what kind of people uh, they actually are compared to how we thought they are. If that makes sense, like with Randy, for example, yeah. we think That's he's just like a little privileged asshole, but he's really a lot more. He's like Jeff in a way, just completely misunderstood and um, <clears throat> more more or less a victim in some way to his well, to his parents, mostly his father. Oh well, yeah, I mean here's the thing too. It's like. When, you know, one thing with prose, you know, when you're writing a story, especially, it's like, 
the reader's only going to get to know the characters if they're, if they're brought in during moments of, you know, conflict or tension or, or you know, that's how they're going to kind of get presented. So, yeah, flashbacks are one of my favorite kind of go-to tools. Um, you know, you got to kind of make sure you don't mess up your continuity when you use them. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> flashbacks are excuse, great. Gives me an excuse to bring back the voice actors for one more go. <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah, I mean, flashbacks are a great technique for telling that story because yeah i mean you know if somebody's in a really horrible fucking situation whatever the plot puts them in then yeah absolutely you're not going to get to know the character as the entire person I mean, if somebody's being chased through the woods by some asshole with a chainsaw you're not gonna run up next to them as they're fleeing and get to have a good one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person and really engage with them of course not um you're gonna meet the pro the byproduct of whatever stress or terror or whatever's in their life so yeah by, by using flashbacks and going back to the happier you know time of their lives then yes you can tell a more complete uh story about that person you can also kind of see what their base neutral personality is when they're not dealing with crazy fucking shit so yeah i i like flashbacks I like like me, me too me too uh okay um i've been asking you a lot of questions well, understandably, as that was the theme of tonight's stream, but I want to ask you this real fast. Do you have any questions for me at all? Anything at all? Um, I mean, uh, I guess, I mean, if there's something you would like me to ask so that it can be explained to your audience, then uh, whatever's yeah. on your mind, just, just ask me anything about the video, anything about the video. Like what was it like recording the whole thing, Lance? How long did it take you? Uh, what was your choice of music? Like, what was the inspiration behind that, or whatever? Anything really? Um, okay, so let me let. All right, here here's a really uh, simple question like that. What what made you decide to go with a mega collab as opposed to maybe just you doing the male voices and getting you know a female narrator for female voices? Right. What was the what was the goal of getting so many people involved? Okay, well, with me, I never intended on narrating this story just by myself. Like, I knew from the moment I first heard it and first read it, I actually wanted to cover this myself. And I, like most people, originally came across the uh, the Creepypasta wiki version, the, the cut version, not the creator's cut on Spin Pasta. But one day when I heard Chilling Tales for Dark Nights actually read it, that made me want to actually narrate the story even more, given all, all the great events and context that was put in this version. I thought to myself, you know what? Something like this could actually work. This can work for a mega collab. Like, get a bunch of people together, just make it like a fully fledged audio drama. It'd be perfect. And I remembered a while back, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights actually did a mega collab for uh, the original, uh, sorry, the 2011 story. And I remember liking that too. I was like, what if I just round up a couple of voice actors as much as I can and just make this into like an actual cinematic, well, not really a cinematic, but more or less like an entertaining audio audio story and that's what i intended on doing all the way to the end like i had an i had a goal something i wanted to achieve i wanted to actually make this a fully fledged audio drama all the way from the very beginning but i thought i thought to myself where where am i going to start what am i going to do um what's my first step in doing this well i guess for one thing though i should read through the story a few times just to get a good idea as to who i think should be cast in these roles. Like I'll take a look at, the, at their dialogue and wonder who I think in this community sounds almost well accurately as to how I picture them in my, in my head. Like for example, with the whole Benny Rosenberg character from the prologue, right? For some reason, each and every time I heard that section and read that section of the story, my mind always flashed to Mr. Davis. Like Mr. Davis was always the one who I thought would be perfect for that role. And when I landed, when I got him to actually land that role, actually you know, play him. I was really happy. I'm like, I actually got someone who I wanted to, who I wanted to appear in this. It's, it's great. Now, um, uh, the months went on and I kept casting a lot more people as to who I thought whose voices fit, fit the description best for each and every character. Like with the whole, like whole, like, um, darkness tales with Matt Woods, Mr. Lonely dark as Lou, uh, dark wolf's Bane as Randy. He was a good choice. Although he wasn't my first choice. My first choice was, was actually my thumbnail guy, Jack DeMac. But he wasn't able to do it. So I had to um, <clears throat> excuse me, replace him with Dark Wolfsbane. And I thought he did a good job because, well, simply put, 
that buddy plays that guy. He plays a really good douchebag. I got to admit, he, he, his performance was really good in that one. And uh, my other friend in this community, uh, Jack Mockery, who also was the voice of Laughing Jack in my Origin of Laughing Jack video. Um, I wanted to include him in this, too. And he also, like me, was a big fan of the story. And I gave him the part of Keith because that's how I always pictured Keith was like the strong, silent type. And I thought with Keith, like his voice was pretty good, like matched it. Even though he has an accent, he told me that he could do American accents. And he sent me a small clip of him doing the American accent. I'm like, yeah, this actually fits really good with Keith. Yeah, I'm going to cast this guy as Keith with uh, Devin Seven playing Troy. Like, I don't know why. Like, when he asked me if he could appear in the story, like, my mind instantly flashed to Troy. Like, this is who I want to have play Troy. I don't know why. Just this guy fits the bill perfectly. He does. Then, of course, with, like, Dr. Creep in, okay, I'll admit it. I only made him the doctor because I wanted it to be theme-related. It's like, her, her, Dr. Creepin's playing a doctor. It's like, yeah, man, let's get him. Let's have him play a doctor. Why not? Because that's in his name. I mean, call me call me cheesy all you want, but that's honestly, that was honestly my intentions, intentions from the very beginning. And then with Swamp Dweller, how uh, I casted him as Williamson. Well, I wanted a guy from the South to play Williamson, is I thought it would be really fitting for the character and seeing how Swamp Dweller is from is from, well, a southern state. I can't remember which one he's from. I think he might be from Florida, if I remember correctly. But uh, I thought he would be a good choice to play Williamson. I, saw, I thought his voice fit perfectly for like the southern cop vibe, you know? And he did a pretty good job, despite how many how short his dialogue was. And then um, <clears throat> there's the minor characters like with Dark Huntress as the nurse and Blindfolded Soul as the... Uh, video store clerk um they did a good job as well even though they didn't have a whole lot of lines i might bring them back in for the sequel seeing how they didn't have a whole lot to say but that's just something i might i might do in the future just bring back some minor characters for other roles but uh well, well the video store clerk actually appears again so um she can reprise her role oh, oh perfect actually yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah then there was this whole fiasco with Jeff's mom's voice actor. Like, there were so many people I had in mind to play him. Like, okay, originally I wanted uh, this narrator named Penny Dreadful Moment, who was someone I've collabed with before in the past. Really cool narrator. I know, check I, her. I know. Yeah, I know Penny. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, check her out. Penny Dreadful Moment. She's really cool, a really good voice, and I've collabed with her on a number of occasions. Now, I wanted her originally to actually be the voice of Jeff's mom, but she couldn't make it, unfortunately. So I had to find somebody else. And I told you before, I wanted to get this girl Eden to uh, play her as well. Cause I thought her voice fit really well as well. Uh, but I couldn't get her either. Then I tried to get in contact with Creeperoni and I tried to get her to play Jeff's mom. I asked her and I never got a response out of her. It's like, damn, this is going to be one of the hardest roles I've ever had to cast like in any, any video at all. So I then tried, well, what if I reach out to someone big? Like it's a shot in the dark, but maybe it might work. And at the time, there were two people involved, uh, two people I had in mind. One was Lady White Rabbit, and of course, I had the idea of her casting her as Jeff's mom because uh, previously I was working with her on an audio drama on my friend Immunity Immunity Zero's channel, where she played like this tough girl and what whatever. I can't remember. I think the character's name was Amber. Amber, I think. And I thought, like, you know what? That voice actually fits really well with Jeff's mom, I have to admit. But then I thought, what if I get, um, what is her name? Uh, yeah, her mind just, Madame Macabre, there we go. I thought about getting Madame Macabre for the role of Jeff's mom, because I thought that would be a really fitting choice. Because her voice is also really good for that kind of role. So I uh, reached out to her. I never got a response. So then I decided... Okay, let's try Lady White Rabbit. Maybe she can she can agree to this, and she did. And I'm entirely grateful for for her agreeing as well as her performance. Like she did a fantastic job, I have to admit. Like she brought a whole lot of life to the character. Like uh, Rabbit, thank you so much for appearing in the video. It really does mean a lot, and you did a fantastic job. But yeah, after I got her casted, um, I, I had assembled the entire cast, and I was ready to have this ball rolling. And so once I got everybody's lines, I'm like, all right, this is it. Let's get this show on the road. And I spent several days on end recording the story. 
why several days? Because it's a long ass story, and my voice can only can only last so long. So, in the span of like three or four days, I spent my time recording the story, making sure to get everything just right, make sure making sure it flowed exactly well as how I always pictured it in my mind, essentially. And yeah, there were a lot of flubs here and there, but I, of course, took those out, and I wanted to make sure it was as perfect as I possibly could could make it. And I'll, I'll admit, it's not perfect. Like, with all the times I've paused throughout the entire video, like, I wish I didn't pause so much while reading it, but then again, that's just my style, so I can't really control that. Yeah, you got to stick to what brought you to the table in the first place, man. Like, yeah, you know, and <laughs> I remember one time, actually, when I was recording... Sorry, uh, I remember I was, I was recording another part of the story one time. Um, while I was doing that, <clears throat> uh, I suddenly heard my nephew... Uh, calling out to me from behind the door. Uh, see, I record in my garage because it's, it's like the quietest place in my house. I know it's an odd choice in my house where um, I can be alone and record. So it's actually where I am right now, believe it or not. But uh, <clears throat> I was rec recording the story in here. I heard him knocking the door saying that he wanted something. I muted myself. And for the past three minutes, I'm trying to get him to go back to sleep because it was like five in the morning. And it's like, he's up way too early. I'm like, little guy, you got to go back to bed, okay? I'm in the middle of something important. And when I finally got him back in the, in the bed, I went all the way back to recording the story again, and I finished it. But I knew I had a really long line of no dialogue that I had to cut out at some point, and I did. I did. It kind of made the editing job a lot easier at that point in time, but still, when I looked at the final playback, it looked way longer than necessary because, well, that one pause just completely ruined everything. But I was able to fix that in post, so... It's not really a big issue anymore, but I just hate it whenever I record whenever I record something and I have like this really long pause where I'm not saying anything. It just kind of takes me out of the whole editing process. But uh, yeah, well, editing is definitely my yeah. you know yeah. least favorite process for anything, whether it's writing or even my even my ill fated attempt at uh, making YouTube content. Uh, editing was the part I is always the part I hate the most because that's when the creativity ends, <laughs> and the technical aspect of the craft begins and then you know it's just it's not nearly as fun to have to sit there and you know uh, take on this very you know technical style now of something that was born out of you know creativity it, it's a very opposing sensation to it so yeah i mean i definitely understand that Oof. i will say the editing process was a hell hell of a journey like there were times where i would just be staying up all night on both school nights and days where I was off from work, just doing nothing but editing, 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 chop the audio, add in this part, this person's dialogue, chop the audio, do the same thing over and over again until I reach the final part of the story. Um, and then after I finished it, I felt accomplished, but then I realized, oh, wait, that's not the end yet. I still have to put in the music and the sound effects and the and the visuals. Well, uh, Jack the Mac was going to do the visuals originally. He just sent me over the photos because we were having some audio or sorry, some technical difficulties with getting them in the video itself. So instead, he just sent me the uh, visuals that he was using and I added those in while also tweaking them a little bit with some special effects. So he was also a big help in the video. So I thank him for giving me the assistance in making it. So, yeah, um, after that was uploaded, it just it didn't stop there. Actually, I, I meant to say render. Actually, when the video was fully rendered. The fun didn't stop there because when I was uploading it several times, the video crashed on me and I hated that so much. Like I get it's an over two hour video, but my God, it should not keep crashing on me the way it is. When I finally got it to actually um, process it, well, <laughs> oh dear God. Okay. It was only one percentage away from actually finishing one percentage. And guess what happened? It crashed. Yes, it crashed. Oh my god, I was so pissed off about that. I was like, you know what? You know what? No, forget it. You know, I'm not gonna get mad at this. I'm just gonna try it one more time and see if it works. And lo and behold, I got it to work, and it finally uploaded. And I was so relieved. But then I remembered, oh shit, I'm gonna have to do this again. I'm gonna have to do this again when Scars of Corruption is gonna be put in production. Well, if you Which really you... intend to read all of them, then it, yeah, it's only going to get worse from here, dude. Because <laughs> they all get, they're all they're all longer, I think, than the creator's cut of 2015. 
Oh, no, I know they are, man. I know they are. And believe me, that's a risk I'm willing to take. Like oh, I said, I love God. the series. It's it's fantastic. Of course, I'm going to keep going with these, despite the whole editing uh, editing struggle that I was having. Well, and I thank you for it. Like I said, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it, you know, I'll call it what it is because, you know, it, within the, from the writer's perspective of this, you know, I mean, um, you know, it is kind of a, a nice pat on the ego to hear your own stuff read back to you. And I mean, that's fine because writing is, is a ego driven fucking craft for the most part. Anyway, so, I mean, that's, that's actually fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is nice when I, and plus like it all, it just kind of goes back to how I like to write and create. I've always been that way. Like, even when I was a kid and I would write some fucking maniac mansion for the Nintendo goddamn, you know, like <laughs> fan story on, on loose leaf paper. Like the first thing I would always do is I would run out to my mom, you know, and like, Oh, read it back to me. Let me, and, and I would sit and like listen to my own crap being read back to me. And I was, it, it I mean, one, you know, from a technical perspective, it's good because it helps you catch typos, you know, and things like that. Um, and two, though, it also kind of helps you engage more with your own work because when you're writing, you know, you are the internal monologue as well as the person writing it, as well as the person, you know, crafting up the story. Like, you're kind of doing everything at once and you can't fucking, you know, what do they say? You can't see the forest if you're looking at the trees or some shit. I don't know. It's kind of like that. You know, you can't really get a full appreciation back of what you created and what you're about to, you know, throw out there to the, uh, to the world, you know, until you kind of hear it come back to you from a different source and especially a source that takes the time to like really read that thing. Like, you know, not just read it line by line in a monotone voice, but actually, you know, put voice to character and have it, you know, put emotion to the dialogue and you really get the full picture of what, you were trying to do while you were doing like 500 things with it. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I love that about the narrations. It really helps me kind of listen back to my work and get a deeper appreciation for even my own stuff, because typically as writers, we take kind of a, a very self hating narcissistic view towards our own work. We're like, you know, it's like, yeah, it's probably fucking trash, but you know what? It's my trash. I don't know. Either way, it is kind of nice to be able to get like more of an objective response to something that you created so you know for that i thank all of you guys like i said y'all y'all did amazing and um you know uh, i know it's gonna still be amazing when you do the sequels and i'm sure your your viewers are gonna love it i know i'm gonna enjoy listening to them uh especially when it gets to the, some of the newer stuff because you know there, there's a lot of readings of 2015 but i think you know scars of corruption is one of those that's only got um a couple of readings and jane i think only has mr creepy pasta's reading and then once you get to, um, you know, once you get to uh, the disturbingly cruel man, you might be, you might be the first one to it. Who knows? I don't know if anybody else has taken on this. Now, so. <laughs> you hear that, MCP? If you're watching this, you ever do watch this? I'm gonna get it, get to it before you, man. I'm gonna beat you to the punch. Ain't gonna stop me uh, this he's time. Like, These two stories ahead of you, man. So I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, if I'm fast I enough. I don't know if I throw down that. I don't know if I throw down that challenge. I'm calling you out, MCP. I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat you to it, man. I have no idea why I just slipped into an accent there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there's ever really is. If there's ever really a real competition out there where people are like trying to be the first to get K. Banning Kellum fucking stories out there, I will, I will say, you know what? I have. Uh, that's the top of the mountain for me. I'm good. I tried to do that with Total Universal Blackout, but then Creeperoni beat me to it. Then I just lost all. All motivation to actually make the video after she uploaded hers. Like, damn it, I was gonna do it, but then she got to it before me. Ah, oh, man. And plus, she's a tough act to follow. I mean, Creeper is so good, man. It's like you. Yeah. You know, if uh, if she gets a hold of it, yeah, man. But you know, and that that was yeah. a great, that was, that was a really fun story too. I, I really. It was, and it's not her fault. I'm not mad at her if, at all. If, if if um, people think I that think I am, so. I'm not, not at all. <laughs> I was, a little, I, was just, I was just a little disappointed that I just couldn't get to it before her. But, you know, she did it. I congratulate her on it. I applaud her. She's really good at reading your work, and that's all there is to it. Yeah, she is. She is fantastic. I, I always refer to her as the voice of my, you know, the, the voice of my stories, you know. Um, you know, a lot of people read my stuff, and I love every single one of y'all. And uh, Creeperoni, though, it's just that, that she is, she, she, with the whole Tobit thing, I don't know, man. That is just something... Like, 
that is something special. And, and she and I have known each other for a long time. She's just a wonderful human being. If y'all haven't checked out Creeper on his channel, please do. You'll be glad you did. There's a lot of my stuff on there. You should check out my Tobit series. And that, that's part of my motivation for turning Jeff into his, the series, too, was um, I didn't – I was so happy when I finished the Tobit series, you know, because I was kind of explaining to you earlier, like, you know, when you, when you embark on a series, you kind of feel trapped inside of it sometimes. Yeah. And I was really glad when I finished it for about, like, a month. And then I really miss writing series, you know, because you can always end a story in a series without having to end the entire, you know, w without having to silence all those characters, you know, forever now. It's like you, you know, there's always more to go. Um, so I think I, re I just realized how much I do enjoy writing long series. And so when I did Scars of Corruption and then when I did Jane and then it's like, okay, time for the next one. And it's like, oh, shit, I'm doing a series again. And, um, so yeah, I will say, man, you've made quite a name for yourself with this series. Like it's fantastic. I love it. I'm not trying to sound like a total fanboy, but honestly, I do think that this series is very well done, very well written and well worth anyone's time to listen to you or read. Well, thank you. Like, I mean, that, that means a lot to me. I mean, you know, I always say the greatest thing that a writer can do is to create an emotional connection with the reader. Um, and not just a, an emotional connection, but also to create emotional impacts, you know, to, you know, it sounds almost, it sounds so mean when you're like, you know, oh man, you know, my story made somebody cry, but that's kind of like, if you're writing a sad scene, I mean, that, that's kind of the goal. Like that's, that's you doing it right. If you can actually elicit real emotion, not just the concept of emotion, like anybody can read a scene that's meant to be sad and they can say, okay, this is clearly meant to be a somber, you know, part of the story. But when it actually can transcend to cause like real life emotional, you know, reactions to it, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a hallmark of, you know, that's a hallmark of talent. And, uh, you know, I've, cert I've read a lot of stories from a lot of people where I've definitely carried those emotions for a few days afterwards, um, sometimes longer. And, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I've teared up on a few books in my day. Um, and I've also gotten super excited when either the bad guy finally gets what he has coming to him or, or whatever, you know, you finally go, fuck yeah, you know, get him. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's an honor to have anybody tell me that, you know. And, you know, so like I said, I mean, it's all gratitude on this end. You know, I, I'm really glad that people enjoy the work. Um, and, you know, like I said, there's still a lot of that series to come. So if you're, if you're into it, you know, it's, there's more to it. I will mention more thing about Creeperoni. I do intend on actually having her appear in the story at some point. I don't know who she'll play, but I do want her to be a part of this. Because after all, she reads your work all the time. She's the best at it. It would be so fitting to actually have her appear in the Jeff series at least once. I can definitely agree that, you know, I think Creeperoni is a great addition to anything, um, especially something that I've written. Um, she, she understands my style very well. And when we... You know, I always get the impression that when she's reading one of my stories, it's like she really she hits the right notes because I feel like she kind of she, she really does have a good understanding of the direction I'm going in with it or, or the feelings that I'm trying to elicit in the, you know, in, in the dialogue or in the plots or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, definitely, um, you know, th there's so much talent out there, too. And I mean, I think it's really great because this gave you a chance to help showcase a lot of your, you know, fellow narrators, and, um, you know, attach your name to something. And, and uh, I mean, I'm glad everybody got everybody, you know, I'm, I'm always happy when anything that I'm involved with ends with everybody feeling like they, like they're a little bit better for being there, which is part of what writing is all about. You want the reader to finish your story and definitely be glad they, they went through it. They feel a little bit, you know, a little bit more something for, for having done it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Oh, and uh, Circa Light says, uh, before I fall asleep on y'all, LMAO, I just have to say that from the part of the stream I've tagged along for, you guys were very entertaining. From JFK to ASMR to narrating, y'all did a good job. Can't wait to see more from you guys. Well, thank you, Circa. Thank, thank you, you so much. That's so nice of you. I think she meant JTK. Now, I don't think we discussed JFK. But, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, when was when was uh, John F. Kennedy mentioned? <laughs> I don't think 
we're doing a conspiracy. We're doing conspiracies now. So uh, my name yeah. is Jesse Ventura. <laughs> but no, um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you, Circa, for for tagging along and listening to this. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate exactly. the support. And, and, thank, and thank you, everybody, for watching tonight's stream. It, I think now's a good time to actually end this. Yeah, I think Circa is 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 um is giving us. I think the universe is speaking through Circa and saying, "All right, guys, <laughs> you're, uh, you know, it's bedtime." Um, but tell me, kid, did you have a good time? Always, I always have a great time, man. Um, oh yeah, it's always great getting you on here for a stream. It's always enjoyable. Thank you. I like doing them. I think I'm definitely more built for streaming than for doing a single YouTube thing. Cause I can only sit there and talk to my fucking self for so long before even I'm annoyed with me. So, <laughs> it is good when you can bounce off other people like that. So thank you as always for helping to provide me a platform to, uh, vocally diarrhea all over the internet. <laughs> well, I don't have any more further questions for you, but is there anything else you want to ask me? Um, no, I mean, um, you know, like I said, I mean, uh, I think we've, I think we've gone on uh, quite as, quite as well as we can with it. Um, you know, uh, I guess I can ask you one quick, easy one, and then I'll throw out a few things at the end. But I mean, when do you think? Um, when, when can we expect to see Scars of Corruption? See, that's the tricky part. I was going to upload this at the end of December, but that didn't go through. Then January, but that didn't go through. It wasn't until like late May that this finally, or mid May, I should say, that it finally did get uploaded. So now that's out of the way. I want to make sure I have a bit more time to prepare for this one. So here's what I'm thinking. Scars of Corruption is going to happen. Bar none. It will happen. I'm hoping to at least get it up. Hopefully. I'm going to try this again by late December. I'm going to try to get it to late December. And if I can't do that, I'm going to make a vow that it will be in January. All these right, you here, folks. These take a lot of time, a lot of effort from casting to recording to editing, all that stuff. It's not a one-day endeavor. So yeah. this is going to be a, a lot of projects, big projects to work on. And on top of that, there are there are a lot of long stories that I want to get to as well, aside from the Jeff stories. But those will come when when they come. Like my narration yeah. channel is not my narration channel is not going away. I am going to keep doing this because it's what I love. It's what I love to do. No matter how many and views, like subs I get. Yeah, yeah. No matter how many how much attention I get, I always enjoy your guys' support. You guys really push me forward. Yeah, and subscribe to him, folks. Thank you, thank you. And of course, these Jeff stories are another thing that, another thing that keeps me going because I love them so much. I want to give them the uh, treatment they pro they properly deserve. Make them fully fledged audio dramas because they're well worth it. And Kay, I have you to thank for that, and thank you so much for sticking by me all this time. It really does yeah, mean um, a lot for all the support you've been giving me. Oh man, like, hey, man. before I jump off, man, I'm, I'm gonna just throw out you know the, the mandatory uh, pluggage there. Um, you guys, please follow me on Twitter. Go to at Bannon K 1979 and hit that old follow button, and then we can talk and bullshit with each other all the time in, in Twitter form. Um, and Kay, check out my book, man. Totally, uh, it's gonna be in the link to with the description of the video. Talked about it earlier, but yeah, totally get the book. You'll be exactly, yeah, yeah. Please, please get Mr. Kellum's book. It's well worth it. It's fantastic. All right. With that being said, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the first Midnight Madness podcast. And with that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching. I am Lance's creepy reading, and I'm K. Banning Kellum. Have a good night. And take care.